Right, I think like I did do a what's new since we last before. recorded. So you have levels. I put everything back the way it should be. Is it a good levels. height? Levels. Yeah, it's a great height. Excellent. Would never have known. You look great. Everything changed. By the way. I got to say. Something about you, you today. You look good too. I mean, it's just, you're well put together. Thank you. Not, I can't put my finger on it, but. Yeah. Just feeling good vibes. Something, something about yeah, it. <laughs> quite, quite unified today. I'm feeling. into it. All right, ready to do it? <sighs> yeah, we're recording, so we are. We can just start whenever we want. I think, or we, we can just say we already did start. I think we already have started. Isn't that nice when you don't have to worry about doing Indeed. things? We'll do a rolling, you a did rolling them. start, as they might say. Roll it. Welcome everybody to episode number one hundred and sixteen of the Goulet Pencast. Where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet, and I am Drew Brown, and we're a couple of sharp dressed. Bella's here. We're shark dress fellas. <laughs> get this, get this shark. <laughs> oh my gosh. So good. And we're here from Goulet Pens, in fact, to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on around here at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we are going to be talking about our top tips for new fountain pen users, new fountain pen owners, in fact. If the Lamy 14K nib is worth buying as an upgrade on a Lamy Studio or maybe other Lamy pens, uh, why we don't see more high-end US-made fountain pens, our favorite holiday ink colors, Drew's favorite items from fictional universes, uh, my Rubik's Cube solving records, and plenty of other turkey hammock nonsense. So... We're not gonna try to break last week's record. I can tell you that much. We went on too long, Drew. I think we found our own limit. I looked at it, the stats were down. People just couldn't handle two and a half hours. I, <laughs> I don't think we can handle it. handled two and a half hours. <laughs> anyway, we'll see what happens this week. We never planned to go that long and somehow we do. Probably because we just keep saying words. But anyway, I'm gonna say fewer words now and we're gonna go right into feedback. That we are. <clears throat> um, one request that I have mm. for our dear viewers is uh, to not, while I'm sure the effort is genuine and you know helpfully minded, using an AI to summarize the pencast in the comments using Tammy AI or another bot mm. could be helpful. But in a lot of instances, the synopsis that it generates is not super accurate and says that we said things that we didn't exactly say. It's not mm. super harmful, but I do provide chapter markers that more or less tell you what's gonna be happening. So mm. I'd just rather not have to deal with that. So if you would please refrain from that, I will just give those comments the chop. So um, thanks, but no thanks also. Is that happening a lot? A yeah, lot every that? episode. Yeah. I think that's happening on a lot of you. you yeah. Videos. The pen cast is probably just too long for it to like absorb well, all of that. It also picks up a lot of our nonsense talk and it's oh, just, you well, know. Well, that is the majority of these it, videos. It, it just, it can sometimes say like, you know, one person thinks that this happens. I'm like, well, no, that's not exactly what we think. So oh, I just want to. The nuance gets lost. Yeah. So let's just, let's just stay away from that. If Fair you want to watch it, you can just watch it. Fair enough. Um, and uh, for an actual bit of feedback though, um, mm -hmm. Peter, or no, no, sorry. Uh, Per Solberg, mm -hmm. per Solberg mm -hmm. says, being a watch enthusiast, I'd say you nailed the Omega Speedmaster, aka the Moon Watch, comparison. Mm. The Lamy 2000 was the very first pen that came to mind when I heard that question, right. for pretty much the same reasons you offered. I don't own a Lamy 2000 yet, but it's on my list of future pens precisely because it's a timeless icon, which everyone respects even if they don't like it for subjective reasons. The Rolex and Mont Blanc analogy was also spot on. Good to hear, because we were not super confident about that, not yeah. being watch people, but yes. sounds like we've got at least we the approval. You know enough to be dangerous, it sounds yeah, like? Yeah, it sounds like at least we've got one also, watch enthusiast who- do you know how many Lamy 2000s you could buy if you sold one Omega Speedmaster? Just saying. A couple, like a dozen? <clears throat> yeah. Um, more than that. Was it like four grand for a Speedmaster? Yeah, something like that, yeah. It buys you a lot of Lamy 2000s, dozen. yeah. Yep. And uh, my friend Fiddle Twist wanted to let us know that the beach resin from Monte Grappa on the Elmo 01 that we oh, featured yes. in the spotlight, um, the resin was made by Tim Crow of yep. the Turnt Pen Co. <clears throat> yep. Um, we didn't mention that when we did we our just, spotlight. We were just flat out wrong. We just flat out said the wrong thing. We said that it was Monte Grappa that was making it. Yeah. They're making some of the resins for their other pens 
we got some wires crossed and we just yeah. totally said the wrong thing. And didn't read our own product description. Yeah. So our website, uh, you know, not, you know, surprisingly was more right than we were. The website is vetted more in more detail and by more people than the words that come out of our mouth when we're talking in a stream of consciousness. In 100%. A podcast. So we would be wrong about some things and we were totally wrong about 100%. that. Thank you for calling that out. Um, and then uh, Fiddle Twist says, I don't know whether Montegrappa worked with you when sourcing the resin from him. How did that work? He makes gorgeous stuff. Um, <sighs> Montegrappa already had yeah. it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we got to kind of pick and choose, but the resin did exist already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes when... I mean, not just with this specific collaboration, but sometimes we will go to a manufacturer with an idea and say, we'd really like to do this pen in this color or this theme, and they'll try to source it out. Or they'll say, we're working with this, you know, like resin manufacturer, we've got all these options we were considering. How would you like to do one of these as an exclusive? And we'd be like, ooh, that one would be really cool. Can we do that one? So it, it, kinda, it can work either of those ways. Um, this one was a little more of like they had a lot of different ones they had already kind of vetted. And we were like, ooh, yes, please. Let's do the beach. That's right. We're really, and really then good at beach. Finally, just a little redaction. I mentioned when we were talking about the Bennu Euphoria in Earl Grey that it contained blue bits to represent the lavender that is in Earl Grey tea. Mm. While there is some specifically lavender Earl Grey that can have lavender in it, I was misinformed. It is not lavender. It is generally uh, blue corn flower. It's blue um, corn flower, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, it's, good job. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate oh, that. Yes, I um, Blue uh, that. corn flower. Uh, um, blossoms. Blossoms, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm literally just reading, reading. Drew right there. <laughs> yeah. So sorry about that. I'm not a tea wizard, but. Um, We're like coffee, yes. coffee people that like. I still don't know a lot know, about coffee. I don't other, either, other I don't than really, that I like it. I drink a lot of it. Yeah, that's about it. Just like I wear watches, but I'm not a watch person. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, am, so. I would call myself a pen person. Anyway. Yeah. All right. I got some feedback too. Tell this us. is from Renork. I appreciate your deep dives, Brian. You think like me. I am so nerdy about doing deep dives on everything that I decided to just go get a PhD because it's the right outlet for people who like to do deep dives on things. LOL. I'm never going to get a PhD, though. That's way too much work. Uh, props to you, though. I'm on page 125 of a 300-page dissertation right now on something random, but I love it. By the way, Drew, I think we should hold a wake for buttered popcorn ink. It was gone too soon. The world didn't deserve it. The world didn't deserve for it to go, or the world didn't deserve to have it? The world didn't deserve to have it. It was just the world wasn't uh, We're not, good enough. No, it's wasn't too, good enough it's for too it. pure for us. <laughs> okay. I did keep a bottle for myself. I was very happy about that. I didn't like, cause we, again, it was like sort of discontinued as we had like sold out of it. So in those situations, sometimes I can be like, ah, oh, crap. I would really want to keep it for myself, but I'd already set a bottle aside. I found it on my nice. shelf today and I was like, yes. I don't always do that with just like regular run of the mill, like ink colors. But I, I knew when we carried that, I was like, I'm gonna want a bottle of this. Recognize. For record, yeah. Do you have a bottle of that, Drew? I have two bottles. Okay. Yes. I, I have would, a, I have I would a, like this thing so, yeah. I have, well, technically, I don't. I have one, and I happen to be the custodian of many a Ferris Wheel Press bottle that just happened to be in my office that technically belongs to the company. Oh. But, <laughs> well, you know, we'll see. I would say that one you can. I, prob on. I probably won't like the large bottle that i do have yeah. like it's gonna take me a while to finish That's that a lot so of ink. it's a lot of ink to go i through. doubt i will ever finish that so. yes technically there are two bottles in my office though yeah there you go well at least you can know that drew's got plenty of his ink yeah, i'll be okay thank you though all right crazy bird nerd excuse me says that guys you got me in trouble oh i love this one watching tv with my hubby the other night and he noticed this weird triangle shaped burn in on our older tv was watching the pencast today and he came over and pointed to the pencast sign in the background and said, look, the triangle. It looks like I'll be relegated to watching on a tablet once we get a new TV, LOL. Well, I think that's amazing for multiple reasons. Um, first off, if you have an older TV, especially if it was a plasma TV, those were more common to get burn in and wouldn't surprise me if that happened, but I find it super inspiring that you watched enough pen casts to where you got the burn in. That is very motivating for me personally. I'm sorry for your hubby. If you if you ruin, <laughs> I think it's a pen cast policy that if you ruin 10 TVs by burn in and you take photographic <laughs> evidence of each one, the 11th TV is on us. Oh, wow. Are you committing to that? 
I'm hoping the technology is going to improve yeah, enough let- to where their burn-in <laughs> won't be a thing anymore. And that is my other comment is that newer TVs, burn-in is much less of a thing. Yeah. Not that it can't happen, <clears throat> um, but they have things now. First off, the LEDs and stuff they have right now are less prone to that. Uh, but also they have like whatever voodoo inside of the TVs that help to prevent burn-in somehow. I don't know how they do it, but I know that's, that's a thing. So, um, But it got me curious just thinking like, how many people are watching us on TV? Because in my mind, a lot of people are watching on their phones. In my mind, are. people have it on in the just, and they're not looking at it. But yeah, it's like, but like, if it's on your TV, I don't yeah. know. Like, I don't. It's just interesting. I've to seen me. pictures. I've seen people send in pictures of <clears throat> their of TV us. with us there. So, which is strange to me. I don't. I don't envision myself right now being on a large screen. And that's so. the thing is like if you have us on a because like TVs you can get a pretty big big size TV now for not that much money. It's not like a big TV is like unattainable for the average person. Um, so it's very possible that we are like life size just in people's living rooms or bedrooms or whatever right now, um, which is kind of amazing. But also I got to be honest, I don't actively think about that no. as we're recording. <laughs> no. I'm usually thinking, <laughs> oh, it's like an audio podcast right. and somebody's like walking their dog and half paying attention. Yeah. And I'm not really thinking like, oh, everybody's able to like look at us. No, we are in their full living life room. size, seeing every detail and like seeing the bags under our eyes and the scars on my hands from cutting trees down. And yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> something else for me to think about. But I was just kind of curious. So I pulled some stats that I thought I would share with you all. Um, so uh, looking at just the year, full year of 2023 on our YouTube channel, 26.4% of our total watch time. So just actual hours watched. Uh, 26.4% is happening on televisions. Oh, like using the YouTube app on TVs? Yeah. 26%? 26.4%. That's huge. Of our entire channel. Dang. And I was like, is the pencast skewing that? Because I would think that like a longer video like that. Um, so unfortunately, without really spending a lot of time and exporting and massaging a lot of data, I wasn't able to get like a full run of all pencasts, but I kind of just went in anecdotally and and pulled some of our more recent pencasts. Some of the pencasts, it's around 25%. Others, it was up to like 42% happening on a TV. So there's definitely various pencasts where it's like almost half the people are watching it on TV, which is definitely going to be on my mind now as we're recording this. I'm going to be like, dang, maybe I will like try to brush my teeth a little better. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Maybe I will do that in Visalign or something. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But yeah, it's definitely got me thinking. I'm like, okay, so either we have people that have us on in the background and are not paying attention at all, or we have people that are like watching us intently in life size in their living room. Anyway, that was kind of fun. So yeah, that happened. Um, All right, so Christy W says, two and a half hours of pen cast, what a treat. Then you add on two pens that are making me drool, Beach and Earl Grey, it must be almost Christmas. So yeah, that happened. Both pens are sharp. They're really cool. I love it when it just happens like that. Uh, And last one I have is uh, from Monk Pedo. Grape nuts have to be about the best value in breakfast cereal cereal around. I remember my first time having them, I poured a whole bowl full like I would with Cheerios. Oh boy, that's gonna be a heavy bowl. Uh, My aunt told me not to add milk because I wouldn't be able to finish. But my pride kicked in and I sat there at the table working on them until she left and I could throw them away. All right. I Why'd want, you throw I them want, away? Why didn't you eat them all? Monk Pato, I want you to know that you have a kindred spirit in this man right here. Yes. Because if you want to have a conversation about pride-based cereal stupidity, mm-hmm. this is the man to have it with. I have more than one story about it. <laughs> yes. I have made myself physically ill. Purely because of my own determination to eat various foods, one of them including apple cinnamon Cheerios. Um, but no, I actually, when we started talking about grape nuts, I was like, you actually haven't had them in a while. So I, I went out and I bought God. some. I had some this morning, Drew. He sent me a picture as soon as he got them. I like, did. I was like, we were talking about it and it's been too long. And I've been eating them again. I'm like, yeah, they are kind of like chewing on small rocks. <laughs> but I like them. No, you don't. I do. You can't. No, I really do. Oh. I've been eating it every day since I bought it. Every morning. And you don't let it I'll mix get in soggy. Some granola. I'll mix in some granola and stuff like that. Oh, you like need that. more yeah. earth. I don't eat any, pretty much any cereal just straight up as it is. I like to just, I like a lot of different things happening yeah. in my cereal. Okay. So yeah, that's, uh, but grape nuts, that's definitely been happening. And throw <sighs> some blueberries in there too. And it's, mm, wow, it's good stuff. Yeah. 
but uh, did make me think about it a little bit. So um, yeah, so your comment about like pouring a full bowl, I have a couple of comments about that. One is when I was in college, my mom had this uh, cereal called Kashi Golene Crunch. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, um, I didn't know that that was like <clears throat> super high fiber, like health cereal type yes, stuff. Yes, it is. And being that I was in college and in like military program and all that and eating like a vajillion calories. Um, I think I had like three bowls of that cereal oh, no. one afternoon and it tore me up. Oh, I bet it did. So I never made that mistake again. <laughs> no, I hope I you stay were away indoors. from that cereal now. I was indoors. Right. Um, but no, uh, it, it, it made me think about the, the way that grape nuts is. You actually have to like over pour the milk because it, it like takes time to soak in. And it kind of reminds me of when I have like a bag of concrete mix and I'm like pouring water in and then you have to kind of stir it up and keep pouring more water in. <laughs> so it's kind of like- Cereal should it's not like cereal be like concrete. that. Oh my God, <laughs> it, it is of, rocks. And it kind of tastes like that too, honestly. Um, but no, I did a little research on it. I was like, how old is Grape Nuts? Cause it's gotta be, it's, it can't be that new because it's It's probably just, what Fred Flintstone actually did eat. Uh, so that cereal has been around since 1897. Wow. Yeah. So like C.W. Post himself like mixed that up. Uh, it's basically like wheat, barley, and something. I don't know. Concrete powder. And all the extra um, pebbles that came out of the earth while they were harvesting he basic, it. Yeah. He basically like baked it into a sheet and then mashed it up in a coffee grinder. And that's how it got its original texture. So I don't know how they make it now. Probably it's a more, you know, advanced. Still more appetizing than story than the origin of cornflakes. Yes, it's definitely not as dramatic as that. But Grape Nuts, it was like, you know, it was in like their World War II rations and it was taken on the journey that uh, whoever, what's his face, when he went to the South Pole for the first time, like had it on that journey. And um, whoever the dude was that climbed Mount Everest ate it on the journey, the first person that- Edmund that, Hillary. Yes, Edmund Hillary ate them for dense nutrients uh, on his journey to summit Mount Everest for the first time in and human history. And Tenzig Norgay, want to give credit where it's due. There you go, yep. So Grape Nuts has been on a journey. And so I will, uh, I'll consider myself one of the, one of the proud many who <laughs> has been fueled by this dense, <laughs> dense I'm in cereal. good company. I'm in good company there. Oh my so. God. Anyway, thought that was kind of funny. Um, that's, it for, that's it for the nonsense uh, stuff that we have at the beginning there. Let's talk about some new stuff. All right, well, as we are closing out towards the end of 2023 here, I thought I would mention this just because it's gonna be running through the end of the year. Um, if you're looking at a Pilot Explorer, we have a deal where you can get a free Con 70, which is what, like an $11 value on a $25 pen? Pretty good. Um, you can go check that out. Any Explorer, you get a free Con 70 with it until the end of December. So go check that out. Big fans of the Explorer here, especially this guy. Um, Next pen I have is the Pelican M600 Fountain Pen, white, red, or red, white, special edition. So they've done a bunch of color plus white. Um, it's like a, excuse me, all white trim. Uh, and then not trim, but all white cap, grip, finial, stuff like that. And then it's got the stripey body to it. Um, I actually have a couple of these myself. I think I have a purple, maybe a teal. Um, but they've done, 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 done a bunch of different colors. And so this is the next iteration of it, red and white. It uh, kind of looks a little bit like a candy cane or like a barber, not a barber pole because it doesn't like spin around, but like the red and white, you know, kind of fits in that vein. Yeah. So um, anyway, it's a decent looking pen. If you're interested, 512 uh, for one of those. I love the nibs on the M600, got to say. It's, uh, I think Rachel said it's her favorite nib, right? The broad M600. She loves it. Her favorite nib. So, um, and then I got a whole bunch of, Sailor Pro Gear Slim Sansui. Uh, these are 236 for these. We have four different ones. So Sansui um, plays to the uh, vitality of flora and faunity. Fla fauna. Fauna. Wow. I read too many words and mixed them together. Um, four different pens. So we have a winter, which is Kamoshika. So it's like a lavender resin uh, barrel and cap. And it's got some chrome accents and a purple grip. Looks pretty cool. Uh, autumn. Not a Chico. So it's pink translucent resin barrel and cap with chrome grip, uh, sorry, chrome accents and white grip. Uh, we got the summer Kumakusa, dark blue resin and cap with gold accents and a rose pink grip. That one's my favorite because it's blue. Uh, and then spring, the Yu Subame, dark navy resin and barrel and cap with gold plated accents and a pink grip. So 
mixing it up. I really, this is one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, Sailor mashes these different colors together that like, I don't know how I would be able to make them do that, but they just, they're really good at picking those hues and making them complement really well together. I mean, credit to Sailor, of course, but when I was doing that Franken pen episode of, or mm -hmm. not episode, but that video, yeah. I was trying to make a really ugly Sailor pen. It was kind of hard. They all just kind of like work together? Yeah, yeah. kind of did. Okay. So, okay. <clears throat> and even the one I thought was ugly, a lot of people thought it was pretty. So there you go. Who all knows? Right. Fair enough. Everybody's um, got a different taste. I've got a unique way to discuss my new thing. Okay. Because we've got a question from Ann Strasco. Ooh. And Ann says, here's a question. What not so obvious fountain pen would you carry as a double O agent? So not so obvious, meaning she doesn't want us to use a Lamy 2000 or a pilot vanishing point or a multi-tool mm. pen or anything like that. Oh, okay. So I was like, okay, putting some rails on there. Well, and the Monograppa 007 pen. Yeah, obviously. Would be the most obvious one. <laughs> well, I don't think that she knew that, but that was a great way for me to introduce a new pen. So Montegrappa <laughs> did come out with the 007 limited edition pen, which is that big crazy pen with all the little bullets and stuff. We went over that in a previous episode, but they just came out with the open edition, which is the, what they're calling a special issue fountain mm. pen. So it is still 007 themed, heavily 007 themed, but rather than the, you know, whatever $4,000 it was, this one is um, $1,165.50. So um, this one definitely more subtle in comparison to the other one that loaded with little cartridges and things like that. Uh, or bullets. This one is a matte black throughout, but it has a ton of fun metal texture that simulates different textures that you would find on a pistol. Uh, the cap specifically has a very obvious uh, section on either side of it that look just like a semi-automatic pistol's um, you know, uh, slide with the little mm -hmm. uh, part where you grab the slide and charge the, um, the pistol. knurling. Yeah. Um, and then, well, are the lines knurling and the... No, I don't think just the straight lines. Okay, so it's the straight straight lines. I think are, knurling is when it's like a cross hatch. So that like that it does have a ton of that. The yeah. barrel is almost all knurling. Right. And then the slide stuff on the cap, they're just straight the lines. Straight lines, yeah. And then the clip is also a bunch of straight lines as well. Very okay. cool looking pens. Beautiful 007 on the nib, uh, laser etch there on an 18 karat nib, I believe. And then on the uh, cap finial, the cabuchon is a glass window. And within the glass window, you'll see a uh, rifled alloy, you know, that kind of spun swirly thing like you would see down the, you know, uh, barrel of the James Bond intro screen where he's walking and then shoot, cool. shoots the barrel. So that's there. And then in, even beyond that, there's a little tiny, tiny mirror. So it is a really, it's probably, as far as cabuchon finials go, Probably the coolest it's, it's one I've there. ever seen. It's up there in complexity. Yeah. yeah. And it's like the depth to it too. It's really, really awesome. It's and Glenn amazing. did a great job taking a picture of it. So if you want to see it um, on the website, if we don't show it to you here now, you can definitely take a look at it. It's a lot of fun to check out. And uh, honestly, for a Montegrappa crazy edition, it's not that crazy. Like it's yeah. it's on the more subtle side of Montegrappa. It's got a lot of detail so that if you like have the pen in your hand and you're looking at it, you can appreciate it. But it's not like gaudy to where if you're like sitting across the table people are just gonna be like what is what that? are you doing yes it just looks like a cool black kind of fancy pen exactly yeah so that's pretty neat we're checking out I'm sorry i totally stole your thunder i didn't even see that that was the pen you were actually yeah. talking about i was like oh the 007 trying to be funny but then i was like oh that is actually the pen no, that you're talking you, were, about. You, were, you were spot on <laughs> all right well yep. great minds think alike and dress alike apparently ah. um which by the way we just have to address sweaters here i mean this is like this Santa Jaws. We, yeah, this is what we <clears throat> we modeled our Santa Jaws pen after. That the specifically, because Brian had it first. He got this his from Target. Sweater. We thought it was funny. We decided, we, we were wondering if uh, we could make a pen out of it. Brian got in touch with the designer of that sweater. Mm -hmm. She gave us her blessing, and we went ahead and created Santa Jaws with Retro 51 in yeah. the uh, fountain pen form. Uh, it was like, you know, a year later, I found this at Marshall's for like 12 bucks. And I thought to myself, I feel like it was more than a year later. It was like two or three. Yeah, years it was later. a couple years it later. Well, you're right. It was well out of yeah. stores. And then Drew just like comes in. And he's well, like, "Hey, look what I've got on." I well, was like, I was wearing it during the pen <laughs> during one of the early pen casts, and <laughs> he didn't know I was wearing it. I went and, and either like took a jacket off to reveal it or put it on. And Did that Brian, on camera? Yeah. Like we were recording? Yeah. It? Oh gosh. So you yeah, it's on. Back and it's see on it. one of the pen casts. Oh wow. And you okay. can see Brian kind of smiles and reacts like. I'm like, where'd you get that? Why are you wearing my sweater? He thought I had his sweater. <laughs> like legitimately, <laughs> the sweater I own was I, on his body. He, I think he, I think you might have asked, like, did Rachel get that for you? <laughs> like, 
And I'm like, no, I, oh no, I bought it, dude. This is not yours. Like, oh, okay, okay. Oh, because I didn't think about it still being available. It anywhere. was so funny. I did not think for one second you would think that I had your <laughs> clothes. <laughs> But you were remarkably that would be weird. That you were remarkably weird. chill about it for for a man who thought that somebody had 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 been had his clothing pilfered. You, probably because I was were... on camera. I didn't want to flip out. <laughs> you know, everybody think I'm crazy. But yeah, I couldn't say. I was. We were in tar- we were in Marshalls. I'm like, oh look, there's Brian's sweater. I might as well pick him up and pick that up and do a little joke on the. Pen I guess cast. I'd be I'd be less weird about that with a sweater because you know that there's always like an undershirt. On. Yeah. You know, if you're just wearing like a t-shirt, I'd yeah. be like, that's kind of weird. It's a little weird. Yeah. Yeah. And also, we're not anywhere near the same size. No, I'd be swimming in a little bit. Yeah, I was yeah, that's why I was like yeah. also a little confused because I was like I I stole it and shrunk it. That was my first thought was like <laughs> is that my sweater? But I was like it doesn't seem big enough to be my sweater. So I was just I was just confused overall. Yeah. Until you explained it and then I was like that makes a lot of yeah, sense. Yes, much more sense. Cool. You ready for some A's and some Q's? Oh, we got some Q's. Not necessarily in that order. Um, let's do it in that order. Let's do this Jeopardy style. What do you oh, say? Oh, okay. It would be very confusing. So no. that is actually terrible. We shouldn't do that. No. But um, yeah, let's do some Q&A. <laughs> All right. Our first <clears throat> Q in order for us to A mm. is from Boone.Gilbreath. Okay. And they ask, what are your top 10 tips for new fountain pen owners? Mm. That's a fun one, right? And that's wide open. It tips, is wide open. Tips. That could be... Dang near any. It could be products. It could be that tipping could be, materials. Maybe that's maybe that's what Boone actually meant, and we 1. just went 1, way off the mark. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're 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 we are going to truncate it a I little bit. A rhodium iridium alloy. Oh, that's boo. my favorite. Tip. <laughs> oh God, hot take. No, we're going to truncate it a little bit, and <laughs> that is uh, the least hot take. In the I will. I know, right? I like iridium tipping, rhodium tipping, whatever. Anyway, You're such a conformist, Brian. Mm. God, and Brian's gonna do I five. Won the followership award, and then I will do five. <laughs> Foomf, as the Germans say. I will say I saw that you wrote yours first, and then I wrote mine. So I tried you, not to. I told you it totally doesn't matter. Steal your it's fine. If, if no, we I both just, agree, then we both I agree. Did, what I did is I I wrote mine. Okay. And then I read yours. Oh, okay. And I was like, okay, we're not just like saying the exact same thing. Excellent. So. But I, I think we have a nice mix. You know? All right. Um, so my first, I didn't, I didn't like put like number one, number two, whatever. Um, so these are not in any particular order, but I have five tips. Um, so the first one that I will say is enjoy the journey. There's no one destination. The fun is in the exploration and learning as you go. Love your journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, after 14 plus years of doing this, I can say I'm still enjoying the journey every bit as much as I did. I have more pens now and I have more experience and I appreciate things. Interestingly enough, you would, on one hand, it's like I'm not as enthralled with some of the same pens as I was in the beginning because again, I'm used to them. I've seen so many of the same types of things, but I actually know so much more and deeper and have context around history and the companies and how they're made and all that kind of stuff that I like appreciate things to a much richer level Yeah. now than I did. So I'm less like, superficially kind of giddy about something like, ooh, that looks really pretty fancy, whatever. Now it's more like, oh, that's novel or that's like interesting. That impresses me more just like viscerally. But now it's like, I appreciate what goes into making stuff and you know, all the backstory behind it. So I still, it, it looks different, but I appreciate it all the more now than I did even in the beginning. So that's, that's pretty cool. You can't say that a lot about like a lot of interests. Where it's like the more you spend time on it, the more there is to appreciate about it. Yeah, and I think that that there's a you know bit of a double edge there because the more you learn about something, you can either become much more appreciative of it and you think that it's beautiful to a much greater degree, or you uh-huh. can become much more critical of it. And I feel oh. like that's the that's that's you know I've talked about this before. I won't like go fan, down that like fandom of. Like I won't go down that hole creative. again. I feel like that's more common but, in in creative works. Like movies and books. And it is, TV but it's also like, like you see that you know if um, you know in uh, in sports fandom as well. Like there are a lot of you mm. know um, a lot of sports fans tend to criticize more than they compliment. Oh, that's true. And uh, it's something that they love, and the love doesn't necessarily take center stage. The deeper mm. you get into a fandom, hmm. so it's a healthy to make sure that huh. the love always wins over the criticism. Um, but, uh, I get how the more, mm. you know, the more, you know, 
you, the more you realize things might not work or the more you mm. might recognize things that aren't the way they should be. Yeah. So it's You're just a, like always looking out for the flaws yeah, and the we, disappointments. They, they become more aware because mm. you you know have greater context. So That's, that's the double-edged sword. Yeah, so you gotta keep yeah. your eye on that if you truly wanna you know, enjoy it as much as you can. Fair enough. Um, another tip, this one I did see that you had so I'm totally going to steal your thunder That's on this fine. one. Uh, get a bulb syringe for cleaning. <laughs> Heck yes. That I, I maintain that as like the single most effective tip that I ever heard. Step one. And get bulbs in yeah. syringe. Step two, buy a fountain pen. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you probably don't even need step one. You probably already have a bulb syringe if you've ever like been to a hospital or been around a baby. Like it's just a very common thing. Like that's what they basically. If you're do. around a baby, you don't usually get a bulb syringe. I'm sure you can find one if there's a baby in your vicinity. <laughs> there's probably a bulb syringe down there somewhere. It might need some cleaning. Um, yeah, uh, boogie suckers, as we called them uh, when we had kids that were young. We still have kids. They're just not young. We don't really have kids anymore. I was looking at my kids as we were eating dinner last night, and I was like, y'all aren't even kids anymore. You're like, not. they're not adults. But they, just, they don't look like kids. They're large humans. Yeah, and they eat like large humans. Yeah. Like we're well past kids' meals yeah. at this point. It's crazy. It's getting expensive to eat out. I'm just saying, it's crazy. Yeah, your your children are not are not small. They are not small. They have my genes. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, f- sort of fortunately, but not f- food cost. Fortunate wise. if they want to be shot putters. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or for like reaching things on high place in high places. Um, anyway, next tip: try as many different combinations of pen, nib, ink, and paper as possible especially as you're starting out to learn what you like because your experience can vary quite a bit based on all these different things. And you can you you can have like one pen, you can try a bunch of different inks in it, but if you're using it all on one paper, that's only like one type of experience you're having. You can try a different paper, that same combination of pen and inks and everything, and you'll get a whole new set of experiences. And it's a little bit frustrating, especially in the beginning because you're like, my gosh, freaking everything that I do differently seems like it behaves and performs in a different way. That's so frustrating, but you're also like, yeah, but that's actually kind of cool because then I can really like fine tune my experience. I just have to freaking learn all my own preferences. But again, that's where the journey in enjoying the process of learning it really comes in. So if you're into that style of a hobby, um, this is a very fruitful one. So I would say just really try to get a diverse uh, set of, of products to mix together and, and get your experiences. Um, next one I have is crawl, walk, run. We say that a lot around here as we're taking on projects, but basically try less expensive, but maybe some like more reliable and recommended uh, pens first, then spend more once you know what you like. So I'm a woodworker and it's very common in the woodworking world to say, uh, buy once, cry once. So basically like buy a really expensive, really good tool. And then you won't have to like keep buying, you know, more and more tools and replacing them and upgrading them and that kind of thing. And that makes a lot of sense when you're talking about tools that might weigh 500 pounds and they're big hunks of steel and, you know, hard to replace, hard to replace and, and, get rid and, of, and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, of. and you know, tools are like, really getting beat up and using, you know, you're abusing those things pretty good as you use them. Fountain pens are maybe not quite the same way. They're not under the same abuse and- Slightly less heavy. It's less heavy and, you know, you can, it's a, certainly a lower barrier to entry to get pens than it is like bid woodworking tools. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, start, but but yes, there's an argument you made like, you should buy like, you know, we talk about things like Lamy 2000 and eight, custom 823 and stuff like that. Like you could buy those, right off the bat, if you like know that you're really into this, I would say if you're like, you know, more advanced in your years and you have a lot of experience under your belt and you're like, I really like writing. I know I really, I'm bought in on the concept of fountain pens and I just don't want to have to buy like 20 different pens to get to the ones that I know that I am really going to like, then I would say you can go straight for the the good ones and the good ones, the the big ones, more expensive ones that are like more the lifetime kind of pens. Um, But me, I had like no money and really didn't know what I was doing when I started out. And for a long time, I didn't buy, I didn't even consider anything with a gold nib. I was buying like 10, 15, $20 pens primarily for quite some time um, just so that I could get my experience and see what I liked and try different nib sizes and stuff like that. Um, So I didn't make a huge investment until I had a better idea of what I liked. 
And uh, that has been helpful as I've invested more in the higher end stuff. I do so when I have a pretty good idea that I'm really gonna like that thing. So, um, and then last one I have is that uh, you should try to make friends with people who are also into pens or just get your friends into pens um, because that's fun for one. You have something like bond over and talk about. Um, you'll increase your knowledge and they'll increase their knowledge and they'll increase your knowledge as you share your experiences. And if they're physically close by, you get to borrow all their stuff and you know, increase <laughs> both of you. It's mutual. Um, you can share your pens and you can try out each other's stuff and it just broadens your own kind of range of experience. So. I recommend getting a friend to start a fountain pen retail company. Oh, that's, and a, that's then, a good one. you know, about 13 years in, they will have amassed an insane collection that you can mooch from yes. almost any time you want. Yeah, that that's really the ideal scenario. I found that so to be highly successful. That, <laughs> Um, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a proven strategy right there. It works. Um, I will say if you're the one starting the, the company, um, it's also a good way to go. Uh, but it's probably a little riskier and a little Slightly, bit, a little yeah. bit more yeah. work to do it that way. Yeah. Um, but really both, both can work well. Yeah. Good track record of success with both of those approaches. Um, those are my five tips, Drew. Very little, good. A little wordy, but yeah. you know. I definitely, I have two that I definitely am going to echo. Number one, buy yeah. a bulb syringe. Yeah. And also gift a bulb syringe. Don't give somebody a fountain pen without a bulb syringe because yeah. it cuts the amount of effort required to clean in half. Mm. And if you know, if you have a bulb syringe already, you know it. You know you love that thing. You yeah. know what it was like before you got that bulb syringe. Don't. It just, it cuts down the time. Yeah, don't give somebody a pen without a bulb syringe. Yeah. Just, I just, mean, just don't do it. I, I don't mind the process of cleaning my pens, but what I don't like is having to repeat the same motion while cleaning my pens. So it's like, I don't want to flush and flush and flush and flush and flush and flush a converter. Yeah. That's really boring. Yeah. I, but I don't mind like taking a pen apart and scrubbing the feed and like doing that kind of stuff. Even if it's like a deep clean, that's still kind of fun because yeah. you're like getting Agreed. to know your pen, all that kind of stuff. It's but fun. I don't want to have to like scrub and 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 or with a piston pen that you can't disassemble just you know you know fill and eject and fill and eject and fill and eject and fill and eject anytime you can bypass that it just speeds up the process granted a bulb syringe wouldn't really work in that scenario but that's why i'm a fan of cartridge converter pens yeah anyway buy a bulb syringe that's my number one thing number two if you're just starting off buy an ink miser and start with ink samples there are okay. a lot of people that say, all right, I'm going to get myself a pen, going to get myself some paper, and going to get myself a bottle of ink. No, don't mm. do that. Like Brian said, you're going to need to do some trial and error, and it's going to be difficult to do trial and error, mixing and matching pens and papers and inks if you only have one big honking bottle of ink that's going to take you over a year to even finish. So buy ink samples and buy a $6 ink miser so that you can fill using those ink samples very, very easily. That is the great way to start. That is a great way to switch things off to find out what you like and mm. what works in your pen and with your paper. So. I will say, going back to if you're starting your own pen company. Oh, boy. Uh, that was honestly a huge motivation as to why we started selling ink samples in the first place because they didn't really exist. Uh, and I was trying to learn about fountain pen inks and I was like, am I going to have to buy a freaking bottle every time I want to try a new color? I was like, this is ridiculous. It was ridiculous for me even selling the products, but then I was like, this is a terrible, terrible way to do this. Like there has to be something better. And I was like, we should do samples. And yeah. it was just like, not even a thought. It was like, this is gonna be complicated to figure out. And it took us forever and many iterations. That's why we don't really talk about the nitty gritty of how we do our samples. Cause it was so much R and D and trial and error and stuff yeah, like really that. Yeah, really what happened but, is, you know, they hired a guy and over the years we've replaced his body parts with different sorts of cybernetics. <laughs> and at this point, you don't want to look at him. Like he's mm. a nice guy. Most of him is inorganic at this point, but just it's not something we want to show on camera because it's not traditionally a pleasant thing to look at. You know, mm. we love him. It, his beauty is on the inside, but uh, <laughs> you know, what we've done to him is not. Six million dollar ink sampler. Yeah, it's not pretty. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I regret what we did to well, Rufus. Know. Rufus, yeah. <laughs> Rufus T. Barley Sheath. Rufus, the, the ink sampling <laughs> cyborg. Um, anyway, uh, other thing that I would recommend to newbies, don't compare your ink collection, your pen collection, or your writing to others. Not people you see on the internet, not friends, not even what you think your writing or collection should be. So many people think like, oh, I shouldn't write because I don't have good handwriting. Or I've, I use fountain pens, but I don't have as good a handwriting. I can't do calligraphy. It doesn't matter. It's not for anybody else but 
you. The using a fountain pen is an intimate, very highly connective experience. That's why we do it. It feels like our pen with our ink, with our nib, with our paper. It is for us. It is for you. And if you like your collection, if you are happy with your Kakuno, your Metropolitan, and your Varsity, be happy with it. That's all you need. As long as you're happy, you're fine. If you write like chicken scratch, great. It doesn't matter. If you're enjoying it, enjoy it. Don't let the fact that someone else is, is someone else has a perceived better collection or better handwriting than you, you know, alter your enjoyment of what you're doing. Don't just enjoy it. If that's all you, if you're happy, stay happy. Just don't let anybody else mess with that. That's the important part. Um, and like Brian said, there will be some trial and error to kind of like get your perfect, you know, assortment of pen, ink, paper. The same thing has to do with pen rotation. You, you might need to try a few things in order to get mm. your perfect experience. But that's, again, part of the journey. So mm -hmm. embrace that. Be cool with it. Uh, and then my final, my fifth tip is to all in terms of also embracing things. No fountain pen is perfect. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, how every fountain pen has something you can say is imperfect about it. But in that way, they're all imperfect. So they're all great. It's just like, what what do you prefer to use? Brian and I have been writing with just multiple fountain pens a day for, you know, 10 plus years. And it's so enjoy, it's so enjoyment, it's so enjoyful, mm -hmm. so enjoyable mm. for us to write with almost any fountain pen at this point, because we have not to say that you know we're in you know more adaptable but it's just kind of like we're used to a random array of quirks at this point mm -hmm. we can find enjoyment in just any writing instrument and that is so liberating and granted we can we can turn on our discerning eye if we need to if if we yeah. need to you know we solve our preferences yeah, obviously yeah absolutely but you can enjoy any fountain pen as long as it's not straight up defective you can embrace the quirks, acknowledge the quirks that a certain brand or model might have and move a little past them so that you can find the enjoyment. Because trust me, the enjoyment is there. It might not be your best or in your top two, five, whatever, but the enjoyment will be there if you look for it. So mm -hmm. just manage your expectations appropriately. Every pen will need a different set of expectations mm -hmm. given to it when you begin to write with it. But if you have a different set of expectations for each one of your pens, you'll enjoy all of them. Just like coffee, I have a different expectation for gas station coffee than I do Starbucks, mm -hmm. than I do the coffee I make at home. But because I use my different expectations to each different coffee scenario, I love them all. Like the, if I'm on a car trip and I need to stop by a gas station to get some coffee, I switch my paradigm and I'm in gas station coffee mode and I'm comparing it to other gas station coffees. And mm -hmm. you know, many much of the time I'm like, all right, nice, this is good. It's not good. <laughs> But I can enjoy it because of where I'm, what I'm comparing it to. So I'm, that's all I'm saying. Mm. The, the enjoyment is there for you to find. Just keep relatively, uh, you know, realistic expectations depending on what you got in your hand. There you go. Tips. Cool. There's your tips. All right. Good question. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. I got one from M Shields Eight. Is it worth buying a gold nib for my Lamy Studio, or is a pen with a gold <clears throat> bib? I'm assuming it says nib. Uh, is that a better investment? So the way that I interpreted this was a pen like the Studio, you can get some of them that come in a steel nib. Some of the colors come with a gold nib. So if you have one of the versions, it's not like you can choose a gold or steel nib on the same pen. That is the case with a few fountain pens out there, like the Diplomat Nexus, you can do that, a couple others. Um, but this one, it's like some of the colors come with steel only and some come with gold only. So I guess if your color is like, you're not strong enough about one color, but should you spend more to get the gold nib version of the studio? Well, this person is just or, saying, is it worth buying a gold nib for my Lamy studio? I'm assuming like he already has yeah. a studio with a steel nib. Yeah. Is it worth buying a gold nib to upgrade the studio? Because a gold nib is going to cost you like one and a half times what the studio costs. Yeah. Or just buy, or just put that toward a, another gold another, nib. Another pen. pen. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? So, um, yeah, you should buy a gold nib for your studio. If you are even mm. thinking about buying a $125 nib for your studio, you must really like your studio <laughs> because that, like, that's an expensive freaking nib, Brian. Like, it's an investment for sure. If you're even thinking about it, you clearly dig your studio. So I say, if you like your studio that much and you have that sort of connection with it and you are thinking about investing 125 buckaroos 
to giving that thing an upgrade, then heck yeah, go for it. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be a more pleasant experience than the steel nib for sure. Now, so, yeah, that is me. Well, I was going to like nuance that a little bit. I mean, obviously they're going to love, if they love their studio that much, they're going to love it either way. Yeah. Are they going to love it that much more with a gold nib on That's it? up to them. I feel like mm-hmm. if, if that that's really the question. Like, do you love your studio that much? Like, is that your pen? Is that just, is your studio like that your ride or die pen? Like, that is like your wingman. You take that into battle and you want to upgrade it so that it is even more special to you. You have even more of a connection with that pen because you invested in it and you put that effort into upgrading its appearance and its performance. Like, that has the potential to become like even more your pen. If it is already your like number one pen, yeah, certainly upgrading it will just make it that much more awesome. So that's my recommendation to you if that is where you're at with your studio. If you wanna ask the pen nerd of me, I would say, no, don't do that. (laughs) Why not? Because you can buy a Pilot E95S for just a little bit more, Brian. And that's like one of the greatest pens ever. That's a totally different pen though, man. It is. But I'm again, this is Drew, Drew Pen Nerd talking, not Drew, you know, talking like customer service Drew. Okay. Okay. If I'm speaking subjectively, you could just pen, you, you will you will enjoy your studio. It's not, it's gonna write pretty similar with a stainless steel nib. Delami gold nib is not super flexy. It's, you know, probably a little bit more wet, but you know, other than looking real nice, it's not going to be $125 worth better than you know, what you have already. Maybe, However, maybe. 140-some dollars for a, Lom- a Pilot E95S, that's a sharp pen. It writes amazingly well. It feels great. It's such a unique and beautiful writing experience that you will have that and you'll still have your studio that you presumably already really like. That is where your money should go. If I'm talking to you as like a pen friend, that's what I do. If I'm talking to you like someone who just wants you to be happy with what you got, then it sounds like you really do love your studio and upgrading it might make you love it even more. And I'm all about you loving your pen as much as possible. So kind of a twofold answer, either yes, go for the upgrade or no, don't do that. Get an E95S instead. And you just get to pick which version of me you want to listen to. They're just such different pens. They're so, I, I love the E95S. Yeah. Uh-huh. But it is an entirely different pen than the Lamy Studio. It is, which is why it'd be great to have them both. Do you want a pen that's exactly like the pen you already have? No, you want a Maybe. variety, Brian. It's Maybe. the spice of life. Going back to what I was saying in the last question about getting variety, that definitely is more the route that I tended to go. Yeah. was like, if I can get, if I can spend money and get a whole other pen, for just a little bit more than like just getting a nib upgrade on a pen I already have, I'm like, I'm gonna get a whole other pen. Yeah. That's always the way that I've gone, but that's not for everybody. Some people are not trying to amass the largest collection of fountain pens that they absolutely can until they die. That may not be everyone's goal. I don't think the Lamy E95S <laughs> is gonna, you know, bring up any spatial or uh, storage concerns with you though. I think you can find a place for it. Uh, at this point, yes. I think you're, you're in good shape. When you get to a decade plus of doing that, it, things can become. Yeah, things can anyway, become. So that's crowded. my that's my answer. Do you have uh, a a nugget of information you want to? I can kind of build off a little bit. I'm not going to expound too much. <clears throat> um, so for me personally, I was thinking like, okay, say you say you like the studio, and you're cool with your existing studio remaining a steel nib, but maybe you wanted a maybe you wanted a pen that has that gold nib. So rather than so in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, you can spend whatever is 125 or somewhere thereabouts. We used to have these gold nibs separately. We do. We still have them. Yeah. Oh, how about that? Yeah, I wrote it maybe down. Maybe it was a certain. Oh, sorry. Maybe it was like the. I might have been thinking of the obscure. Yeah. So 124 dollars for the Lamy gold nib. 144 dollars yeah. for the E95s. So where I was approaching as I was reading this question was a little less of like buying a whole other brand of pen. I was thinking just sticking with Lamy. So for me personally, the nice thing about having one of the gold nibs on a Lamy is that you can take that gold nib and you can put it on any other Lamy pen except for the Lamy 2000. That's got its own thing going on. But literally every other Lamy pen that you use, you could put that gold nib on it. You could put that gold nib on a Lamy Safari. You could put it on your studio. You could put it on a Lamy ABC if you wanted to. I have one on, on an all-star right now. You can do that. That's cool. That is... Definitely a unique thing about <clears throat> Lamy with their gold nibs that you don't get that with most other brands, the versatility of it. 
So in that respect, I'm like, it's really nice to have a gold 14K Lamy nib because you can put it on any Lamy pen. That's a good point. Uh, that said, you can buy certain Lamy pens that already have the gold nib on them. So Only I was just, like three of them. It, it's not very many. Yeah. Like the Emporium and then a couple of studios. I don't think we sell the Emporium anymore. But they're still around. Oh, okay. They weren't very popular for us, so I don't know if we are still having them or they might be on yeah. the way out or whatever. But um, those have them. But then, yeah, you're right. There's not a ton of options, um, but that is an option too. Um, so I was kind of doing the math and like, can you actually get some bang for the buck? So I was looking at like um, the the... We have two studios right now that have a 14K nib on them, the Palladium and the Piano Black. For whatever reason, the, Pal the Piano Black is more expensive. They're not the same price. So the Palladium one is 167-ish. Um, if you get a steel nib studio, that's $80, right? So you're paying almost $90 more to get that gold nib, but a spare gold nib is 124 and the nice thing is if you buy a pen, if you're interested in the pen, if you're buying a pen that already has that 14K nib on it, you're also getting the whole other pen. And you're not just going to have Why do you need this, two like, studios though? Well, it doesn't have, so it has to be a studio. I guess it would have to be a studio or it an would, emporium. That's, so, yeah, but yeah. you're kind of talking studio. But if you really like the studio, you may want another studio. I'm just saying, that's not crazy. I have a, I have every, I have every studio. <laughs> that's I crazy. Because I am a little crazy. <laughs> But I'm just saying, there there is logic to that. Drew doesn't like this logic, but I- E95S is $145, man. I also think you should get an E95S mm. and you should enjoy that as well. It is, I, I picked the E95S because it is the most affordable gold nib pen that we sell. That is fair. And I will say that if you, re, if you know you really like the studio, I'll say the Palladium Studio is really nice too. It is. So if you wanted mm -hmm. that gold nib and wanted to get a little more bang for the buck than just buying the spare gold nib, if you got the cash, by the Palladium Studio with the 14K nib on it. And then you could swap that nib to put it on whichever Lamy you want. And you're getting that cool Palladium Studio. That's kind of what I was saying. But you could also go with the better choice. suggestion. It's really no wrong way to go. You're going to enjoy any of these. Only, no, suggesting. no wrong way except for what Brian just said. So question number three. <laughs> wow. Is, <laughs> All right, Drew. Modern Quills is asking you, Brian. Mm. Why doesn't America produce any quote unquote high end fountain mm. pens like the EU slash Japan? Oh, cool. Can we talk like global politics and economics? I think we're going to have to. I don't think this is a deep dive. I have a lot of bullet points here, but it's not a deep dive. I know, I know when I'm deep diving and I'm not. Um, this is like a, I'm going up to the knees in the wading pool of this one. I'm not just splashing around in a puddle. You're, I'll, talk I'll go about, you're gonna talk about your deep dive again before you <clears throat> do that. <laughs> so I think it depends. I think this one depends on your perspective. Yeah. If you ask a non-fountain pen user uh, what they consider to be a high-end pen, it would be literally any fountain pen that exists. Yeah. They're like, you would pay five dollars for a pen? That's insane. Like I genuinely get that response on a regular basis. I mean, they sell five dollar pens at Target. Is it really that crazy? They do, but most people. I mean, okay, five dollars is low. Yeah. But like twenty, thirty dollars. That's a, that's a high end pen. That is high for end, the yeah. average person. Agreed. Of, not just fountain pen, any pen. Yeah. That's that's an expensive pen. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um. So when you were like, oh yeah, that's like, I was like kind of the low end for fountain pens. Like it. it that's like the starting line. And then you just are off to the races. Um, so I think all of this needs to be like sort Nuanced? of like calibrated. Oh. Yeah. Like, so I don't know what modern quills is considering to be high end. I genuinely don't know. That is totally open to interpretation. I think they're basically Some people just meaning like there, there are a lot of fountain pen companies that come out of Europe and Japan sure. and no fountain pen companies that are made in the U.S. I mean, I think that's honestly the broader stroke to this answer is there's just really not a lot of fountain pens made in the U.S. Yeah. at all. There, there, there are like small makers. Small makers, but in but, the in the grand scheme of things, I mean, I love our small makers, especially yeah. U.S. made. Like that is awesome. But there is no secret that making things in America is more expensive than making it in a lot of other places in the world. Um, not all places, but a lot of places. So it, to me, it's kind of a combination of, well, you have, you know, there's definitely, there's no 
Um, I'll say like, yes, there's no like super high end, but there's also no real super low end pens made in America either. Like you no. don't have anything like the Pilot Varsity or the Platinum Preppy or anything there's no, like that. I would, there's no there's mass no, produced there's fountain no, pen that are that's made in America. There's really no mass produced. I can't say all pens, but I don't know that there are any mass produced pens made in America. I don't think that that is the case. But yeah. I can't speak to all there's, pens of all yeah, everything. Yeah, I would say, I would say like, you definitely know, definitely not found pens. Yeah, there's not a factory churning out pens. I don't think so. Not I think it's been a few decades before that's yeah. many decades since that has happened. Yeah. Many decades before we were born since that has been the case in the United States. Yeah. I wonder what is the the largest American made fountain pen company. Fountain pen company? Like like yeah, like who who put We're talking out, like actually manufactured made, made in America. Who who creates the most fountain pens and sells them out of their building in the United States? Franklin Christoph? Maybe. I think they're, they're, that might be they it. have to be up there. They're up there, but they're like what a dozen people. Maybe? I don't know. And they got some equipment stuff like that. They 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 can turn out some pens. Yeah, but still, they're like even that is like so small and so niche compared to like mass production manufacturing. Yeah. I mean, like seeing the Lamy factory, I was like, oh, this is like a whole other level of anything that I had ever seen before. Um, and they're like among the bigger ones, they're not even the biggest. So yeah, it's it's all gotta be calibrated to what you're talking about when you're talking about- Is the about main thing that it would end. that it's expensive and that would mean it would create expensive pens that no one would buy? I mean, I think you have I think you have a couple things going on. So I'm not I'm not gonna deep dive into like politics and economics and all this kind of stuff, but there's definitely a skills gap where it's like fountain pens have not been manufactured in the US for literally like a couple of generations now. So there are just there's just not the institutional knowledge in any companies in the US of how to even do this. So the ones who are doing it are literally it's like a passion project and they're doing it independently and they're having to essentially figure out how to do it from scratch. And they're still not and they're still not making feeds here. Yeah, not mostly. I will say I will Tim say Tim McKenzie makes feeds but not really mass produced. Really? Yeah, he makes some like Ebonite feeds and stuff, okay. I think. And I will say yeah. we we talked about um you know, uh, nibs and feeds made in the U.S. a couple episodes ago, and I neglected to mention Shone's Monarch nib. Yes. So I will say that Ian Shone yeah. does, can make his own nibs Ian and Shone, feeds. Yeah, but so he's a good example of like a newer manufacturer yeah. in the U.S., like really making stuff in the U.S., but it's not anywhere near mass produced. And honestly, so this is where, where the more of the nuance comes in with what do you consider high end? So Drew, what do you consider to be like the like the dollar cutoff for like a high end fountain pen? Uh, do, you have like a, say... do you have like a dollar in mind? Because there is there is no firm answer for this. <clears throat> it's really up to to everybody. So I'm just it kind of means different things to different people. I think that where would you consider that cutoff? I think it's usually kind of like around the gold nib territory, probably. So like if it has a gold nib on it, basically it's high. I end. think that's a pretty easy. So like one fifty plus. Yeah, I think that's a pretty easy line to it's high end to call. Yeah, I mean, why yeah. is there a gold nib pen you wouldn't call high end? Um, yeah, I like, mean, you I could make see, an argument for it. Yeah, you can. You, I can't imagine pointing to any gold nib fountain pen and say that's not high end. See, it's tough. It's tough because there's such an upper range to the, like the expensive pens that it's hard to have a cutoff that low in my mind, unless you just consider high end to be this huge range. And then it's like the affordable stuff. Cause there is, I mean, most pens are falling into that sub, you know, I think you would, $150 I, I, range. I still think that works. I think you could say the same thing about most hobbies. I think that the, you know, lower end is smaller than the higher end of like watches and knives, even cars really like- Oh, for sure. You know, a mm -hmm. high end car is probably, mm, something that most like 90 percent of people won't drive ever yeah for sure yeah um yeah so, i'm sure there's like a there's like a law of diminishing returns type you know hockey stick curve of of you know anything that would be considered like high-end or luxury in, yeah. in basically every market watches you can well i guess it's rather, rather than like trying to figure out what <laughs> high-end means why don't we just talk about like why there isn't like a big like europe and japan are where the big fountain pen companies are like yes. i wonder why there's not a big fountain pen company in the u.s I mean, I think I think that gets into a lot of different factors that are well beyond my understanding of just like yeah. manufacturing in general. Yeah, I definitely in the don't US. know either. You know, it's it's definitely difficult. Like even if you look at the big iconic fountain pen manufacturers of your, yeah. your Schaefer's, Cross, Waterman, Waterman, Parker, 
Conklin, you know, these like iconic American companies. I guess the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. A lot of them either started then manufacturing overseas or got bought by foreign companies and, you know, are, are basically just not, not like the, what they were founded, yeah. you know. I guess that, that therein lies some of the answer, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely why, I mean, that's why you don't see a lot of pens like in general. But what is interesting though, is when you think about like, okay, so you have these independent makers, right? That's kind of, that's kind of really the only thing you can talk about in terms of American, truly American manufactured pens. There's a lot of pens that are like companies are in the US like headquartered and they do design and assembly and packaging, stuff like that. But when you're talking about like the factory, it's it's often going to be overseas, yeah, um, because of cost of labor and all these Always types of things. Always overseas, actually. Uh, pretty much, yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, unless you're talking like an Ian Schoen or Franklin Christoph or Edison or something like that, where it's like they have a yeah. small operation, yeah. You know, they're making the stuff themselves. You know, the materials might come from another country, but they're like basically getting raw materials and then making the pens. Well, um, you know what? It's it's actually kind of cool that America is where we have you know, this proliferation of independent makers, you know, joining the fountain pen community. Cause a yeah. lot of though, like we have a different sort of fountain pen community in the hobbyist sense mm. in America that doesn't exist in a one-to-one -one ratio in other countries. Mm -hmm. And I think that these independent makers are born from that community, from yeah. that special hobby. And that in mm -hmm. a way like, yeah, okay, we might not have factories, but we do have this community and we do have mm -hmm. these makers that are born of the community mm -hmm. for the community. And that yeah. I think has just as much value, if not more value than having a US based factory. I agree. So I think there's a couple of things at play. If, if I want to be like kind of negative about it, I could be like, oh, it's hard to manufacture in the US and all that kind of stuff. Okay, sure. But honestly, I think some of it has to do with culture as well. Like we don't have the same culture around writing in the US here as there are in, like there's a strong correlation between countries like Japan, Germany, France, Italy, you know, the UK, where it's like, there are still like fountain pens used in more in general. There are more stationary stores. Kids are taught writing more intentionally in school, maybe especially even with fountain pens. That hasn't happened in the US in a long time. So, you know, if you're, if you're not emphasizing that as much in the culture in general, well then of course the manufacturer of these products is not going to make a, a lot of sense because the demand is just not going to be there. So the reason you're seeing more high-end and honestly pens of all types in other countries, you know, like Japan, even like India, China, you know, are, a lot of them don't get exported, but they make a lot of pens for their own countries um, is because there's just a lot stronger culture of writing um, that is happening in those countries. So, you know, that's that's also, I think, a big factor. But what, what's kind of fascinating to me is in the US, we do have kind of that entrepreneurial kind of spirit. There's also a lot of laws, I guess, that are like more favorable to small companies and entrepreneurship than arguably maybe in some other countries. There's definitely plenty of like independent makers and startups and stuff in other countries. It's not like the US has a lock on that. Um, I just think that's like, a little bit easier way to go about it, especially with the demand. Um, but I would say that it's interesting because a lot of the independent makers in the US are not making low end, like mass produced pens, but they're also not making super high end stuff. I think if you're saying like gold nib pricing territory is sort of like where your starting line is for the high end pens, then pretty much every independent pen maker is making high end pens. But for me, when I'm thinking about the range of high-end pens, I'm thinking like limited edition Viscontis and Monograppas and Namikis and stuff like that. You're talking like maybe $1,000 plus if you wanted to peg it, or maybe $500 plus. You know, I don't know really any independent U.S. pen maker that's making a pen that's over $1,000. You're going to have Those are technically manufactured in Europe. Oh, I see. He's designing them and stuff like <laughs> okay. that, but yeah. like the ceramic like stuff that's yeah. actually in the UK. So even yeah. that like so he falls into like more the the kind of design in the US kind of thing, but um so it's Prusak, like maybe. Yeah, but like he makes cool stuff, but I don't think any of it's over a thousand. Like you're going to have a hard time with any of these independent pen makers. You'd have to just like I think some of them throw are. Some, so they may flirt with that, yeah. but that's like you're not into the five thousand. No, 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 you know. No, no. So I do think that's kind of interesting. I think that's where you have some no, of the, I think some of might, the skills gap and there the might craftsmanship be some, and stuff. There might be some 
artisan makers who do like, oh, I made a fountain pen with reclaimed wood from the first Jamestown settlement. Like you might charge 10 grand for that. But like I maybe not. But not I think really. I might have heard of like one or two of them throughout over the years. So you might get an anomaly every now and then. That's really but, all it is. But <clears throat> but honestly, like if you're talking like Machia and like the, the monograppa stuff that's like yeah. engraved in jewels and like that type of stuff, we honestly just don't have the like people that do that no. mostly in America. For, no. for I would consider those to be least. like more like, you know, I say, you know, there's like, you know, kind of the regular stuff, the high end, and then above high end, I put luxury and to kind of like- Okay, that's fair. To kind of cross into- So, so luxury is like a step so, above high end? That's in, kind of how mind? I view it because that, that okay. you, you get outside the, uh, the use territory and into the, you know, that that's when it becomes a piece, you know, it's like- that's when it becomes a writing instrument. Yeah, it's no longer a yeah. pen. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one way if you want to just yes. kind of, you know, play around with terminology. It's if all you subjective were, though. If it was going to be a television commercial, would it be in black and white? Yeah. That's when it's luxury, right? Yeah, just hear um, some orchestra in the background. <laughs> that's right. Um, but it got me thinking. I'm not I'm not a vintage expert, but I'm thinking like in in terms of like maybe maybe I was thinking a little more luxury than high end, but like did the US really ever make high end fountain pens? I think they definitely made some that were like, you know, more expensive. Fountain pens in general for a time were a definitely more expensive writing instrument than, you know, the other pens maybe of the time, like early, mid 1900s. But then I, I think they actually went more luxury once the ballpoint kind of disrupted in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, cross and it became a lot more discretionary. Went up there. Yeah, and Mont Blanc like really took and kind of ran with it. I'm talking it. about like US companies. But I'm saying like, I don't know if there are any, any US fountain pen manufacturers really made like the high, high, like Namiki level kind of high end pens. Um, I don't know if that really ever happened in the US. I could be wrong about that. This is where I would really be open to anyone in the comments who's like knows a little more of their vintage history. And again, we're being kind of vague in terms of like our dollar amounts and stuff like that too. So I would just really be open to feedback on this because I'm genuinely curious, like what were like some of the higher end pens that were like manufactured, like more soup to nuts in the US. I don't really have anything that, come to mind. I mean, like the Schaefer snorkel and stuff were definitely like more complex and kind of expensive to make. And I guess they were like more high end for their time. So there could be, I don't know. I guess it's kind of an interpret, open to interpretation of where you consider those cutoffs. But I, I, I wouldn't consider like the same level of what we consider high end from Japan and like, you know, like these monograppa type things. This is what I keep going to, but I don't know that really the US ever made stuff like that. So I don't know. It could be done, but I just don't know that the economics are really there to support it. So that's my thoughts. All right. All right. Got a, ooh, I got a twofer for you here, Drew. Um, so this is from DM John So. Favorite holiday ink? Is there one that shimmers with green and red? Green and red shimmer. Like the glitter in it itself is green mm -hmm. and red? I'm sure that could happen, right? It could. It could. But it hasn't. It hasn't. No. Probably because it wouldn't look great, right? Like... I mean, there are a lot of shimmerings that I don't think look great. Somebody can do it. If it gets done, it'll probably be done by Ferris Wheel Press. If you mix fairy tales, if you mix green and red together, what color does that give you? Like holiday. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to think about like on the color wheel or whatever. Like green and red are not like opposite colors from each other, but they're not they're not that close. No, they're a little more on the opposite they only side look, of the spectrum. They only look good together during the holidays. They would kind of. No, but I'm talking like if you put red and green shimmer in an ink and it would all swirl together, it would be like mixing latex paint. Like you wouldn't see a distinctive green and red. You'd see this like muddy brown looking color. Maybe probably, that's why right? no one has done it. I don't know. Because I've like messed around with some like mica powders and stuff that you can get at Michael's Crafts or whatever. And you can like throw some of that junk in your ink and mix up whatever the heck you want. Yeah. And I did some experimentation and I definitely came up with some stuff that I was like, I don't know what color this is now. Um, that's kind of what I think would happen. But maybe we can distinguish that as like, are there ones that shimmer green and red, not green and red, like together. Like, what do you mean? What was that first thing you said? Green and red, like separate inks, like different inks to recommend. Some that are green, some that are red. Oh, that's too many. Like that's, yeah, I didn't. But that like opens up the possibilities to. Yeah, I mean, they're. Greater than zero. Take your pick. Yeah, that, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> I didn't I didn't do research on all of the green shimmers and all of the red <sighs> shimmers. Well, I'm disappointed. Well, that's not what they asked. Sounds like an opportunity <laughs> that's for That's not a, what they asked. That's a, a different question. A Drew deep dive. No, that doesn't happen. <laughs> 
Um, so anyway, <laughs> favorite holiday. Are we not moving on to the second one? Or Oh, I figure we can stick with that one and then okay. we can go to the second um, one. Favorite holiday ink uh, is easily Diamine Winter Spice. I've said that before. That is one of my top inks of all time, not just a holiday ink. But it is a brown ink that sheens green with blue shimmer. So you've got a nice trifecta of all three of my favorite colors. I love it. I currently have it inked up in this pen. Um, I have all three. I've, I've got kind of my holiday pens inked up right now. I have a green, this is a Heritage 912 um, from Japan, and I've got my uh, Sailor Pro Gear Slim Christmas Pudding that I bought last year, I love this one. And then I've got a Pilot Custom Impressions in red. So all green and red and brown, very like not not like bright holiday, very earthy mm. holiday. So in a good my- good right there. Ah, thank you, Brian. In my green 912, I do have Diamine Winter Spice and I love nice. it. Um, I wish I, I, most of my pens are extra fine, so I tend to, you know, not see a lot of You're shimmer just and sheen. Cutting that ink off at the I knees, know. Drew. You're missing no, out. It's still pretty. It's still pretty. It's still pretty. Um, in my uh, red custom impressions, I have Diamine Noel, and then mm. in my Christmas pudding, Pro Gear Slim, I have Diamine Holly. Mm. So all three Diamine. Uh, I think all three of these were in the Blue Edition series. The first. Ink vent, maybe blue and red. Winter Spice might have come out in the red edition. Mm. No, sorry, red edition was first. Uh, no, blue edition was first, then red. Anyway, um, they're all from that series, so they're all very holiday themed. Uh, this is the second time I've tried Diamond Noel. It is a red, and I don't like it. I really, I didn't like it the first time either. And I realized it after <laughs> I started writing with them. I'm like, oh wait, no, I don't like this. Oh, did so, you remember that you tried it and you were just like, I'm gonna give it another go, or did you like forget that I you forgot used it? that I tried it? Yeah. <laughs> so I should have just gone with Matador because that is great. Mm. So anyway, I wouldn't recommend Holly. It's fine, but it's not like a bright, happy red, and it's also not like a dark, like you know. Uh, fall red either. It's just kind of like a in between, not really committing to any sort of red. Red. I do like um, Holly though. I will recommend Holly heavily. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say right now, if you would like to try Diamine Holly right now and a week from now, which is uh, today is the um, Friday. The uh, what you call it? What's the what's what's the pen cast day? Friday. Friday. Anyway, whenever this, you can look at <laughs> the like, dates. See literally when, what day is Friday this when, week? When this thing publishes. 22nd. 22nd. From the 22nd to the following Friday, you can type Holly 29th. in the 29th. Great. You can type Holly in the coupon code, promotion code area of your checkout. And if you add an ink sample of Diamine Holly, it'll be free. Just type in Holly, all caps, in your coupon code box. You can get a free sample of Diamine Holly. So, should Enjoy made, that. Should have made the sample know well since you just sold it so well. Yeah, right. <laughs> Take it. Take, Take it, it because I just don't like it and I want to get rid of it. <laughs> it's fine, but there are better reds out there. So I've been enjoying Holly quite a bit. And of course, I love Diamond Winter Spice. Mm -hmm. um, and then the great thing about Diamond Winter Spice, as, I, as I've said before, is that sometimes with shimmer inks, the shimmer tends to really fade after about halfway through the converter if you're not agitating it perfectly every time. But what you're left with is still a brown with green shimmer, which is mm -hmm. already great in its own right. So another reason I love Winter Spice. Um, you can't really go wrong with any of the Diamine purple, red, green, blue series because they're all heavily holiday themed. Yeah. I don't know if there is a ink with red and green shimmer within the new purple edition uh, series of the Probably Inkvent not. calendar. Probably not. Fer Ferris Wheel Press tends to be the brand that puts two different colors of shimmer in one ink. It's yeah. not something that most brands do. I can only think of the Fairy Tales segment of the Ferris Wheel Press inks as being uh, colors that have consistently gone that route. So I would keep your eye on those. Um, as far as a, other favorite holiday inks, Polar Glow is an easy one to recommend. It's immensely popular. It's a blue ink from Diamine. Uh, definitely, I think it, that one and Winter Miracle, probably the two most popular ink mint colors in our store uh, of all time. But I don't know. I don't generally go with blues for holiday inks. 
Don't know why. Really? I, I kind of like the more cozy feel. Like when I think of winter, the thing depends that, on the holiday. The thing that makes me. I mean, Hanukkah is like straight up blue. I guess I just think of like winter in general, not necessarily the holiday. But it's um, about, yeah, if you interpret holidays, just the much holiday broader. season. Yeah, and this is like we're obviously in the northern hemisphere yeah. as well. You may not consider like snow and yeah. ice and blue and all that I kind like of stuff the, for like winter because if you're in the southern hemisphere your winter is i just don't know what's what's blue in, in the holidays like i just don't like you don't you look around like n- there's not a lot of just blue like it white and brown i mean i saw like i was at home depot and i saw like this six foot tall jack frost like uh, animatronic I guess some people use freaky, blue to represent cold thing. i guess yeah yeah. I wonder why. There's a lot of blue that happens. Yeah, I mean, we're wearing, I'm wearing blue, so. Yeah, I mean, well, I, mean I have a lot of blue sweaters. And, yeah, I guess blue's usually, yeah. like, since white can't really be seen, they kind of, like, substitute blue in there for, like, cold, like, blue's ice. Blue's just a great color for it, literally any time. It is, but so. you know what, man? I never use blue ink. I, I feel like What's when wrong I, with you? I feel like when I first started out using fountain pens, I just used so much blue. Yeah. And then I'm like, And I'm that's just, the way to live, man. <laughs> I just stopped. I did I got, the same and I haven't stopped. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I think I got tired of it because like there's, they kind of all look the same. I I think I know Joe had probably like 70 different bottles of oh blue ink, like maybe more than that. Yeah. I, I guess, cannot help it. I just, also it's just a feeling. You just hate blue. Drew. It's a feeling. That, well, he, there are so many like pretty much perfect blues, right? There's a lot of amazing blues. Like, and I guess that for me, I only sample and I rarely use the same color twice. Okay. I feel like I've already got blue figured out. Like there. blue is such a known quantity. I don't need to explore blue anymore. Hmm. I've got like, I could throw a rock and hit like 10 amazing blues you that could. are flawless. It's hard to screw up a blue. But something like red, like with Noel, like I'm still trying to find like a couple really perfect reds. I've got like- an inferior color. I'm not going to argue with you, <laughs> but I feel like there, there's- there's there's. Biased. I feel like there's there's territory that I need to trailblaze out there in in the red zone and in the green zone and you know pinks and yellows like there's 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 it, it's a frontier Brian where blue is Fair home enough. you know blue is known it's familiar I know it's there if I need it you're not like revolutionizing anything with blue yeah you're just like starting with something that's already great you're not wrong and you're not wrong you're just making it maybe even better. <laughs> I, I like when I'm using fountain pens, I appreciate the exploratory nature of it. I like, you know, trying new things. So I can't fault you for that. Yeah. So anyway, um, those are my favorites. Yeah. Um, Real quick. Yeah. To follow up because I, I was like, I know there's like a thing, like a wheel of color, color theory type thing. And I found the thing that I was like visualizing. <clears throat> and yes, red and green are opposite ends of the spectrum. So complimentary. On the color theory. Well, they're like, no, not complimentary. They're like... Isn't that what complementary means? Uh, contradictory, I think, would be the more appropriate way. Are, are, isn't yellow and purple on the opposites too? Yes. Well, that, they would go good together though. No, they go terrible together. That's why the Lakers have it. No, not, not like mixed together. No, no, no. Oh, you're talking about mixing. Yes. Oh, oh, I see, I see. When I was talking about like having one oh, ink no, no, that yellow has and red pur- and green No, no, shimmer. yellow and purple are brown. They make brown. That's terrible. Yes. Rachel makes fun of me because when I did the platinum mix-free inks when they came out, I didn't think about color theory and I was shooting the video with, I don't know, very little preparation. This is probably like eight months into our business or something like that. It was very early on. And um, as I was shooting the video, we did the classic, I was recording and Rachel was in the other room kind of yelling at me as I was recording. And and I picked the purple and the yellow. Oh no. To mix together in the oh, mix Oh no. And I was like, I don't know if these are really gonna go together. And I mixed together and it was like this footy brown, oh, yeah. like this terrible looking color. Oh. And Rachel was like, those don't go together. Oh And I was man. like, I don't know, we'll see what happens. And I was like, yeah, this looks terrible. Oh. I think that video still might still be out there. It was like in our like house. I don't even know if you were working here yet. Drew. I remember, I remember one? when Mix Free showed up. Okay, so it would have been like, we had very to, early we had to on. figure that whole thing out. It Still came the with garage. a little squirty thing, and oh, oh yeah, it was yeah. very confusing. But yeah, that's and you think mix free means like you don't mix it. Like, like no, you're mixed. free to mix it. Free like, mix oh it. god, that's so yeah, confusing. We, we had to do that anyway. Um, yeah. So anyway, they are on the opposite spectrum. So no red green shimmer together would look good. I don't think. Yeah. Um, okay, my thoughts. So I don't know. I'm kind of obviously. Yeah, I feel like you're traditionally thinking like reds, greens, silvers, per, golds, whatever. Um, I do tend to think of blue a little bit. Um, and I tend to think of like, um, other stuff too. Like I, you know, I don't know. I went with green for me, like a really good, uh, holiday kind of theme is Emerald of Shabor. 
It's not a classic like spearmint green. It's a little more of like a teal, a, a little more on the teal side. Um, but it sheens pretty heavy red and it's got gold shimmer. So I'm like, you got green, red, and gold in one ink. That's pretty good. And it's just a freaking awesome ink anyway. So that's always for me like a good de facto like holiday ink to write with. Um, I also noted Diamine Holly. So that's cool that you had that inked up because I thought like that's a great uh, red green thing. Um, so going with more of a blue option, um, I went with another Urban Blue Ocean. So this is a, it's a little bit darker blue, but it's got a silver shimmer to it. So I don't know, me, I've always loved the combination of blue and silver. Diamond's got a couple um, of those too. They got a couple of those as well. Yeah. yeah, it's not a unique thing to them, but I don't know. That was one that came to mind. Shimmering Seas, I think, look. is that blue or mm. is that is that is that um gold or silver shimmer that's a good question then they have jack frost i think Google that's that. one of them uh, anyway jack frost yeah that one is blue with silver yeah that's a good that's a really good one too um let's see here starlet c that's another one. Oh yeah that's, that's an good. option as well there's a whole bunch of them so mm -hmm. you can just look literally it's cool you can just filter on our site by color and then you, you know, if you go to fountain pen anchor, you can go bottled ink or samples. Um, and then you can check the color that you want in the filter and then you can check shimmering or not. And then that can narrow down. If you're like, oh, I want to see blue that has shimmer in it. You can do, filter that down very easy on our site, which is cool. And I use that all the time because I can't remember 800 plus inks. Um, and then I had a Ferris wheel press green with curiosity. So this is an emerald green with a red and blue shimmer. So a multicolor shimmer combo. So there is some green and red and blue in there. So that's kind of an interesting one. It's a cool looking ink. I haven't actually inked it up in a pen to try it myself, but that's in there. Um, another good one, Diamond Best Wishes. I had that on there too. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. Red. Yeah. I think you actually ink up more of your pens with like holiday colors than I do. Yeah, I make sure I always, well, I, I get excited. A lot of my, I have a lot of brown and green and so That's I just get, like more in your, in oh, your wheelhouse anyway. Yeah. Well, it just makes me feel cozy. Like I think of like cabins and pine and mm. warmth. Like that. Okay, that's like enough. that's to me why I love winter so much is that the feeling of going in from the cold, out from the cold, into the, out from the cold, in from the cold to warmth. Like mm. that is just such a vibe and I want to capture it in okay. as many ways as possible. Makes sense. Okay, and then the second part of this question from DM Jonso, can we get more space for longer questions? Yes, if I put up an Instagram question thing where you answer and provide questions for uh, Pencast stuff on Instagram, if you can fit it in there, great. If you have a longer question, all you need to do is email us at pencast at and you mm -hmm. can write to your heart's content. However, if you write super, super long, I might not We're read not all of have it. Time to read the whole question. I, I might get overwhelmed and just mark it unread and have the intention to read it later, and I just might not do it. So we'll see. You want to keep it a little brief, but you know, you still can you know, go, yeah, go nuts. To be fair, like answering in the little Q and A thing on the it Instagram, is you you are like original Twitter character limit type limitations. Yeah, it's pretty limited. Um, can they also DM us on Instagram? I know that that. Um, I don't if, think we have like quite the same workflow for filtering all those questions to us, but we definitely like look at those. Yeah, you can, you that's, can. that's another option too. If you don't want to like switch to a different application, you want to keep it within Instagram, you could, you could DM us as yeah. well. You get more, more characters there. It'll still get forward. It'll, it won't go straight to us at Pencast, but it'll get forwarded it'll, to customer care and get then there they'll eventually. have to give it to us. But yeah. Especially if you say specifically like Pencast question, yeah. you know, if you caveat it with that, then, yeah. then, then they can it'll really get there eventually. forward it to us. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right. Now we've got some bonus questions, Brian. We do have some now, bonus questions. We had some questions that were for me and you specifically, but weren't really pen related. But I was like, you know what? We're going to skip uh, the pen spotlight today. So why don't we yeah. just, you know, add in some sure. little fun randos? Why not? So, um, yeah. You going to talk about your Rubik's Cube uh, records? No. <laughs> no, that's all for you, I was going to say, I kind of tagged on to your question, but I don't know <clears> what you're going to tag on to mine, but. Let me start off with yours. Do you want me to read it? I'll yeah, read go it ahead. to you. All right, this is from Java Perez. If you could get any fictional item from any movie slash universe, what would it be? Um, easy, because ever since I was a kid, I've wanted a Green Lantern ring from the comic book character Green Lantern. It is a ring that using your own willpower, you can kind of create anything to your heart's content. Uh, Sounds like a cheat code. 
Well, it's a superpower, man. And it also protects you from mortal injury. As long as... So God mode, and you can create whatever you want? Uh, long Basically as like sandbox mode? Well, ring? you do have a weakness to the color yellow. What? Well, Why? sometimes. It You're depends. green. Green has yellow in it. No. Why is yellow bad for you? I don't know. It's not always... It's not like... It's a sus. It's not always a thing. It's a thing in some versions of Green Lantern. But oh, anyway. Is it not like original canon? Or is no, it... it definitely... Well, the original, original Green Lantern was... Uh, his weakness was wood. What? Yeah, he couldn't really do a whole... Wood's awesome. <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, Green Lantern Ring would be amazing. You could create anything you want. Uh, your imagination just could run wild. I just had some a thought pop into my head with like, if your weakness was wood, of having like a wood like mech suit or like a suit of armor made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> to like fight I'm against Green Lantern. That there, would be there, really funny. There might have been. Who knows? Um, <laughs> that would be my first choice. Second choice, and again, comic book related would be, well, I guess kind of movie related, would be Doctor Strange's Eye of Agamotto, the, the time stone where you can just kind of like manipulate time, open up portals, all sorts of cool stuff. Mm. But actually, technically, that doesn't open up the portal. So nothing, but anyway, the Doctor Strange stuff would be cool. The eye could rewind and fast forward time. You could get away with a lot with that. I totally... Agree, yeah. Time travel's fun. I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, Green Lantern would probably be my number one pick, though. And I would use both for the good of humanity. I would use the ring. I would go, I could fly over to different parts of the impoverished world, you know, build dams, create lakes. Not out of wood. All stuff. I wouldn't. I, 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 it's not yellow ones either. God, you're the worst. Um, but I'm gonna, then. I'm going to build a yellow if, mech suit out of wood. If anybody wanted something selfish for me to help them with, I would I would do that too, but I would charge them. And then I could buy the other stuff that I didn't add on this list, like the Batmobile and the Ghostbusters car and some DeLoreans by charging rich people the use of like, hey, oh, you want me to do something crazy with my ring? Well, here you go. Give me the money. And then I can buy all the other stuff. So that way I can select this as my one fictional item and then acquire other fictional items that can be acquired in real life. Like you, can, you could get a Ghostbusters car. You can get a... You know, yeah. a Batmobile. If you have enough money, you can't yeah. get a Green Lantern ring. Hmm. So that's why I picked that. Interesting. So if somebody takes Green Lantern's ring, do they also have the power? Like, is it the ring that has the power? The ring that the ring has the power. Yeah. So like, he's really just a dude. Yeah. With a cool ring. Yeah. So is that really a superhero? Uh, technically, the ring chooses him or the a previous Green Lantern chooses him, you're mm-hmm. supposed to be chosen for your ability to overcome fear and uh, someone who has strong willpower. But you can have your ring yoinked from you and stolen. So wow. that definitely has happened. Doesn't sound too super to me. No, Batman has yoinked Hal Jordan's ring a number of times just to be a jerk about it and be like, hmm, yeah, I got this now. You'd think he of all people would know how uncool it is to have your cool stuff yoinked because he's not a superhero either he's just got batman cool batman doesn't like how jordan they don't get along well why not because batman relies on fear and how jordan is you know has fear, the ability fearless. he has the ability to overcome great fear no no not fearless brian that's an important aspect of the oh green god. lanterns oh god i can't keep track it's of not this. about being fearless about this overcoming fear. why is anybody into this this is so much <laughs> to have to keep track of Overcoming fear. Fear is real, but overcoming fear. Okay. That's where courage comes from. Okay. Not being afraid is not courageous. So to have the ring, you have to be courageous? Absolutely. Okay. Also, fear is what the yellow lanterns use. What? There's yellow lanterns too? <laughs> My gosh. This is terrible. That's why I hate fantasy. <laughs> I can't remember all this crap. There's yellow, there's indigo, there's blue, there's white, there's black, and orange. And did I say red? Yes. Okay. What are all these other lanterns? Well, Brian, red is rage, orange is avarice, blue is hope, indigo is love, and uh, white and black are both like life and death, pretty much. Um, and then, uh, oh, yellow is fear. Yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there so there's all these other lantern people with these other colored rings? Yes. Why don't you hear about any of these people? You. Th- they should make like three or four terrible movies about them and then we'd know about it. Oh, God. <laughs> Isn't Green Lantern the one that they just like can't get it right? Unfortunately. Yeah. I don't even, I haven't even seen any of this and I know that like Green Lantern is. Well, they've only made one. Screwing up. Oh, really? Yeah, they've only made one. The Maybe one with Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. Okay. Yeah, it's not good. That's funny. You'd think he would be able to 
do a superhero movie. I mean, he did because he's like it killing just, it with Deadpool. Yeah, it's just a bad movie. Yeah. Okay. Well, he also did another bad Deadpool that no one likes in Wolverine Origins. Oh, that was a he? terrible movie. Oh. Yeah. Mm. He had like no face and swords came out of his arms and he was still Deadpool, but oh, okay. it was like a crappy Deadpool that was awful. Anyway, okay. you we're 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 you're making me deviate. You're asking me nerd questions I'm, and I have no choice but to answer. This you're, is just a world I knew very little about. Like Rachel and uh my son, Joseph are playing re, replaying now uh, Zelda Breath of the, no Tears of the Kingdom. They've done Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Rachel finally beat it all the way through. She finally beat the final boss, um, and now she's playing it again. And I'm just like watching them play this game, and it's just like giving me headaches. I'm like, there's so much just stuff in this world in this game. I'm like, I don't want to think and have to remember all this stuff. You have to remember like, oh, this is a thing, and you have to build the. <laughs> doodad with the who's he what's he and you gotta get your meat and have apples to regain your power i'm like i can't keep up with all this <laughs> any rpg game i'm just like it breaks my brain and it's i have miserable. a limit i have a limit i'm a console rpg gamer okay pc rpg gamers it's like next level that's like world next of warcraft level, and all that kind of yeah, stuff yeah that's that breaks my brain. I, can't. I have to say, I'm not judging anybody who's into that stuff. I, it's to me, it's like phenomenal how you can remember any of this and keep up with it. So like, m m like mad props. But to me, it's probably how when I talk about like trees and woodworking and stuff, people are just like, "How this is so boring?" And why are you talking about this? And <coughs> how do you remember all these tools and stuff? My brain just works different that way. We need to but move it, on. It works in the opposite direction. Oh, okay. We're yeah, we're, we're dragging it on. We're an hour and a half. Um, in. Okay. Well, in my response to Drew's question. Uh, a quote came to mind from Arrested Development from Lucille Bluth. It said, I don't understand the question and I won't respond to it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we do have a question just for you though, Brian. We do. And it is from Eward, mm -hmm. or Eward 580. How fast can Brian solve a Rubik's Cube? So if this, if the, this was, if the previous find one, out? if the previous one was in my nerd zone, this was in definitely I do in have a couple of my your, backpack, your nerd zone. Um, Okay, I guess this. Yeah, I don't. You, I guess you really can't be into Rubik's cubes at all and not consider yourself a nerd. It's very much a nerd like. And when you talk about like not beacon. understanding why someone would want to do something or wrap their head around something so complex, this is how I feel about you and the algorithms required to memorize in order to complete a Rubik's cube. That's fair. That's fair. But it's less about having to remember, and it's more like practice and muscle memory. So in that way, it's a little more like it's more like. A musical instrument than it is like yeah. just having to remember raw facts and data the memory is connected to your body yes that's why i can do it understood but there are people who are really good at memorizing like actual algorithms i can't it's actually i have to overcome my weakness there to be able to do the puzzle solving so um, let's say like a standard rubik's cube like the yeah. what six by six is that average no no true well, what's what's the regular three by three three is, by three standard rubik's cube Oh, three by three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that what I meant. That is like the first Rubik's That's what I meant. But like three and three equals six. Okay, yes. No. Three by three. There is a six by six. That's not what I'm... I, I was visioning three by three, but I said it... Anyway. Yeah, that one. How, how fast can you I solve... Have, I have one to show. Because I've seen you I've seen you put one together in, uh, when we were uh, flying yeah. together. Yeah. So I remember you were I timing... Do like you had doing, your, I do like doing them on planes. You had your little app. You were timing yourself. Yeah. So what's, what's your record? So here's a three by three. I'm not going to solve it right now because I've, I'm very out of practice. Um, so I actually looked back because I have an app where it, it gives you the algorithm, like the scrambling algorithms and stuff. So, the, okay, let me, cap, let, me, let me caveat this by like, I'm not a, I guess technically I'm a speed cuber because I have measured my time for solving a cube. Oh, look, here's a little magnet. Um, yes, that is a magnetized one. Um, but I'm not a competitor. I've never actually done a competition, but uh, Rubik's Cube solving competitions are so much a thing. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people do this, uh, but I don't. So I've only just tracked my own times in an app. Uh, and so it gives you the, the scrambling algorithms and then you tap it, you solve it, and then you tap it when you're done and it tracks your time. There's like a little ratchet in here. Like a... That might just be the friction of it. <laughs> you hear that? You like that sound? It's not, oh, really, yeah. it's not really a ratchet. No, you're right. That one just sounds weird. No, I just haven't lubed it in a while, oh, okay. so it's just friction. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was. Yeah. I thought that was a nice um, touch. So I have different cubes that I've solved. So in in competition, you have 
a two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, six by six, and seven by seven, along with some other different shapes. This is a nine by nine. That's pretty fun. Um, I have not timed myself with every one of my puzzles. What about that one? I've timed myself a lot with a three by three, and my personal best record that I've timed myself with is 25 seconds. Whoa! Uh, 25.3 seconds. Whoa! Yeah. That's awesome! Now, I haven't done that many times. My average is way higher, more in like in the 40 second range. Wow. But that was my fastest. I've done under 30 seconds a few did times. You, what did, how did you react when you got that low? Oh, well, I was really excited because I wanted to be able to break 30 seconds. That was really my goal. Yeah, I think that's what you were working on on the plane that and one it took time. Me, it took me a while to be able to get there. And I've kind of plateaued out. Like, I don't think I can do it. I mean, uh, so my very moderate ankle deep dive in here is, you know, 2530 is impressive if you don't know much about Rubik's Cubes, but it is not impressive at all. Like I would get <clears throat> laughed out of a competition for being so slow because that is such a bad time. Uh, the world record time for solving a three by three actually just got broken a couple of months ago. It's 3.13 seconds. This is a fully scrambled Rubik's Cube. But then th th does that mean they just got really lucky with the scramble? Uh, partially, but also I'll explain more about the person that won it. It's not luck. Oh. He's practiced more than you or I could do any one thing in our entire life. Oh my. Um, so the other, I looked through my app of what other cubes that I had that I've ever timed myself on. And I timed myself on the six by six once. So that's my record, I guess. Uh, six minutes and 51 seconds. Um, which, you know, is a lot longer, but it's way more complicated. Uh, the world record for the six by six is 59.74 seconds. Jeez. So I'm remarkably slow for that. Uh, and then I also timed myself four times doing the seven by seven. Uh, and my fastest time was nine minutes and 21 seconds. But the world record is one minute and 35 seconds. So, but that's world record pace. So I'm probably like slightly above average. Like I can impress people as a party trick you know, with solving my cubes. I mean, I think it's impressive that anybody can solve one ever. It's remarkably simple if you kind of understand how it well, works. Well, that's the hard part is understanding how it works. That's the challenge. A three by three is not that complicated. The bigger puzzles do get a little more complex. A so three by three is plenty complicated. It is, but I got a really good intro video to show you about how to solve it that will break it down for you and make it more accessible. I would need to be paid money to watch an <laughs> intro video for Rubik's Cubes. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I'll watch an intro video for your Rubik's Cube and I'll find another equally like okay. nerdy video for you to watch. Oh, about, I'm sure you could. I'm you know, sure you could. Let you watch a video review of Ghost of Tsushima or something like that. Um, so <clears throat> the thing I wanted to say though is all of these world records that I have here are all set by the same guy. Oh my God. His name is Max Park. I think he lives in California. He is like full blown autistic. He has the most heartwarming story. So he was like entering into his teenage years. He couldn't even like unscrew a bottle cap off of a soda bottle. He was like so off this charts autistic. Oh wow. Zero like social skills. But his parents were like trying to find like a way to basically help to like socialize him in the world because he was like so debilitatingly autistic. But he like latched on to Rubik's cubes and puzzle solving and he obsessively practices. And he's also just like kind of a savant in this way. Yeah. But there's this really good Netflix documentary that's called The Speed Cubers. So there's this other guy, um, his name is Felix. He's from Australia. New Zealand, maybe technically. Um, and he was like the goat, he was like the champion speed cuber kind of before Max. And Max like idolized him. And so they're like competitors, sort of. But it's such, they have such this like heartwarming relationship where they like support each other and like Max, especially because he's, you know, essentially got this yeah. you know, debilitating um, disorder that he has like basically become like a functioning like human in society through speed cubing and stuff oh, like this. And wow. he's become like this champion, but he like totally idolizes Felix and Felix is totally supportive of him. It's like the most heartwarming thing. It oh, kind of reminded amazing. me like the support that you get in like the speed cubing world is to me kind of like echoes the support you see in the fountain pen world. Oh, they need to make a movie about this kid. Well, they made this Netflix documentary and it kind of, it talks about Max a lot. 
Um, and this was in 2020 as well. He's like broken all these records even since then. But like his relationship in particular with Felix is super heartwarming. So if you're into just a heartwarming story, it's really cool. But if you, especially if you're into speed cubes and all that, it's a fascinating story. So I highly recommend you watch that. That is cool. Yep. Anyway, that's it for the questions that we have this week. Um, yeah, we are really going long, aren't we? We haven't even gotten to the what's happening yet. Gotta Sorry, Drew's trying to move it along, and I'm just not letting him. We're, so. gonna, we're not going to go over two this time. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Uh, email us at pencastagulipens.com if you have questions that are long, too long for Instagram. Uh, hmm. We're skipping the spotlight. Let's go right into Turkey Hammock. So what is happening? Uh, Friday, we went over to a restaurant called... Mm-hmm. Uh, hope, I forget what it was called. It was some downtown, right up Broaden Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took us forever to get seated, but it was nice. It was our friend Josh's birthday event, okay. mm-hmm. and um, it was a big, big table. So it's like one of those birthday things where you don't really get to talk to, but the p- th- three people kind of in front of you. So, <laughs> oh yeah, you know that's always a little awkward. Luckily, we were sat next to some people that we very much wanted to speak to, that so that helps. was nice. That's good. Yeah. yeah, so that was good. So it was an interesting dinner. They did a lot of small plates. So like um, a hmm. lot of like um, empanadas or little tiny, okay. tiny biscuits with, you know, uh, uh, pork bellies, stuff like that. And it was fun. I just got a burger because it was the most normal thing on the menu. So um, <laughs> that's fun. I just want to be not hungry. I don't care. Yeah. Um, I've, I've really kind of figured out that I just don't care about food. You're not into like fancy I'm restaurants. I'm really not. Like yeah. I just don't, t- I can't tell the difference. Like I'm like, why would I pay more when I'm just going to be like, yeah, this is pretty good. But I'm also going to get a burger and say, yeah, it's pretty good. So anyway, I yeah. got a burger and it was pretty good. <laughs> so we did that. And uh, it was interesting. We In that restaurant, there was, uh, <clears throat> it's called Harry's. It was called Harry's because mm-hmm. I know this because there was art all over the restaurant of different mm-hmm. famous Harry's. You had okay. Debbie Harry, Harry Houdini, uh, Harry Potter, you know, and mm. uh, it was all AI generated art. And mm. it all looked pretty cool. Okay, Some of it was very obviously AI though. And <clears throat> there was a piece very close to us that they were saying, well, who's that guy? And we couldn't figure out what Harry he was. There was obviously somebody in the middle that was the Harry, whoever, Harry who. Right. But then it was surrounded by a bunch of other characters. And one of our dining mates was saying, oh, I think I recognize that person. And I said, no, that person's not real. That, that's AI generated. I could just tell. It was like, mm. you remember when AI images were very 70s looking yeah like it was one of those gotcha. like it was dead giveaway yeah that, you know had like nine fingers and no no the fingers were fine three legs like they were they were edited ai photos yeah. so like so yeah. they were professionally done you know yeah. he fixed anything that was weird but you could just tell like there was a tightness to the face okay. that was a little uh was off-putting. it made to be kind of artistic or was it meant to be like kind of photorealistic it was made to be artistic it would okay. look like it looked kind of like an album cover like one central face and then like a bunch of other okay. people around it looked kind of kind of like a mad max movie poster or something okay. like that this okay. one all okay. the other ones were very different gotcha okay. but uh that led to the debate is it ai or not and we actually found out that it was that's the whole thing every image was ai and then you're just like called and, it well then we started debating is ai is it art <gasps> um and oh boy that got that's a rich dinner <clears throat> conversation it got it got interesting and like i mm. i i ultimately landed in that it was like it's art kind of like um photography is art meaning you are not completely fabricating something from scratch. Mm-hmm. You are capturing, in a way, something that already exists. Um, mm-hmm. With AI art, you are pulling in information of pre-existing mm-hmm. pieces, mm-hmm. which is what AI generative AI does. Um, and with photography, you are capturing something that does exist, but you're kind of making it your own because through the use of art, mm-hmm. you're making it a different style or like you're, okay. you know, enhancing it or altering it in some way where it's uh-huh. not just the reality, it's your perceived reality. Okay. So, but that, that was not agreed upon. Some people mm. were saying like, it's not art at all. Some people were saying like, it absolutely is because everything is art. And I'm like, yeah. well, you're right too. Like, you know, both Ugh, y'all are right. So debate. It, like, it was a, what is art? Yeah. Like, oh, it, it, it eventually went Has down. This conversation route. devolved to this. It did. Okay. It 100% did. Yep. But anyway, it was a lively dinner conversation. <laughs> I was not feeling well. I was like uh, getting over a cold. So I was done. L- luckily, I was like, hey, Shannon, can we leave? So we did. Okay. Um, 
The next day, we took Archer to a birthday event for a uh, classmate of his at an ice skating rink. Oh. And he had never been ice skating. He doesn't know how to roller skate either, but he still wanted to go. Okay. It was a disaster. He hated it. Oh. He did two laps around, the first time pushing a stack of buckets, which apparently they keep at the ice skating rink for kids to kind of like push around. And a stack of buckets? It's a literal stack of upside down buckets, yes. I wonder and if it, those buckets would be good for carrying rocks. No, no. Saying. There's no way they like would carry. Like five gallon buckets? Yeah, five gallon buckets. They just stacked them up to like different heights, depending on like how t- tall you are. So you just kind of like use them as a walker. Okay. I don't know. That seems but, pretty low effort. It, yeah, definitely. I mean, when I took my kids ice skating once, they had like a like a whale type thing that was like this place had, had buckets. Handles. Like it was made to no. help kids learn how to do it. Ice Zone in Midlothian has buckets. Okay. So there you go. He was miserable. He started like just grabbing the rails. He, when I saw him coming close to the exit, he was just shaking his head like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. so I'm like, oh, okay, you want to go, buddy? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah. So we were right there by Chesterfield Town Center, one of the few remaining indoor malls in our immediate area of mm-hmm. Richmond, Virginia. It, but we went in there to just go to the box launch store where they saw a bunch of Disney fun random Let me crap. guess, the place was thriving. Dude, it was packed. Really? It was. Well, I was joking. No, it was slammed. Wow. I could not find a parking spot. Wow. In the entire, like, it was crazy busy. Wow. An indoor mall thriving like it was 92. Wow. It was wild. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's like a dozen other ones that have closed around it. But yeah. I guess it's just maybe supply is finally like balancing out with demand. Man, I guess. It was, hmm. I was like, I was about to not even go in there because I saw the line to enter and exit the parking lot. And I'm wow. like, honey, do you really want to go there? Because we didn't need anything. We just um, wanted to look at that shop because we were in the South Side and we don't normally okay. get to go over there. Right, right. Man, indoor mall slammed. So that was crazy. Okay. Um, next morning, we kept one of Archer's friends for a couple hours while his parents went to do some yoga. And then we met them for uh, some Chinese food. And uh, we recommended Yen Ching because, as you know, I'm obsessed with that restaurant. Stuck in the 90s. And uh, it is, and it's just glorious. But our friend, she was like, okay, well, that's interesting. We, we don't usually eat inside of Chinese restaurants. Like, to her, it's like, that's, <laughs> it's you like can take out. place, yeah. But so she was like, very clearly like, oh, okay. That's an interesting idea. But then when we got in there, they're like, okay, this place is pretty cool. I'm like, yeah, it is. This is the best. There you go. So that was, It's that like was, the indoor mall. It's like... All the other Chinese restaurants around it are just like takeout only. Yeah. Now. But, but there's this that like, one is well, like the, the, the servers one that's wear bow ties and there's fresh carnations on every table. Come on now. That's pretty classy. Respect to Yen Ching. Did you get the hot tea? Heck yeah, we did. It was rainy that day. It was a perfect day for hot tea. Maybe that's why the mall was slammed so much because it was rainy. It was I mean pretty crappy weather on Sunday. It was it wasn't it wasn't uh, that was a different day. Um, oh, Sunday okay. was when we had Chinese. Saturday was when we went to the mall. Oh, Saturday the weather was great. Maybe people just like wanted to get out of the house. Yeah, it was a little windy, but other or than that, it was, it was, it was nice. Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we did watch the movies I wanted to watch. Watched Muppet Christmas Carol and watched Klaus. Okay. Yeah. And you like said that that was like <clears throat> the thing you wanted those are the to ones? do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we also, I think we, we've decided we want to watch the new Christmas story movie, like the new one where Ralphie is like an adult okay. and he's like, yeah. so we want to, we haven't watched that one, but we want to try strike that off the list. I haven't seen it either. We watched Klaus and after the movie ended, Archer is in front of me. He can't see me. He created a little fort that he was watching the movie in <laughs> and the credits start to roll and he says, let me guess, dad's crying. <laughs> And Shannon looks at me and says, yep. Crying like a big dumb like, banana. I y'all are jerks. <laughs> this is an emotional film, okay? These are happy They're tears. They're like mocking your emotions? Not really. Like they, they both were feeling it, but I'm the only one that leaks it. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. leak my feelings and they just it's fair. crush them with their mind vice. I consider that brave. Thank you. Willing to do that. Yes, I totally control it. Um, and then... <laughs> This morning, I woke up at 5.45 to make advanced Disney dining reservations for oh. our vacation in February. Wait a minute. 5.45? Yeah. I thought this happened at midnight. I we was, were talking about I was, this the other day. I was misinformed. <gasps> my, 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 my friends, I think, might have overestimated the perks that they get through their reservation of a friend's oh. Disney Vacation Club membership. Okay. Which I don't think that that matters. Anyway, we thought it was midnight, but we didn't. Yeah, they were wrong. I don't, um, really, I don't really care one way or another. Anyway. Like Rachel's we, planned so <clears throat> many. Like, she takes Disney planning. Like, that is the actual 
event for her. Yeah. The vacation is like almost superfluous. Well, for us. She loves the planning so much. We're going with our friends Josh and Jeffrey and Jim and Dan, and they are all about the rides. They're like planning. Okay. Like, they're going to do park hopping so they can get on that ride and that ride and that ride. Shannon and I are just like, where can we get the best food? Yes. And That's like the rides are cool. About. Like we've got some rides we definitely want to check off, but if we miss a ride, we're not going to be bummed about it. They're but not. if we don't get reservations at Ohana, we're going to be bummed about That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Like I want that bread pudding. Heck yeah. Yeah. So we got Ohana. We got a few of the ones that Ohana we- means we, family. We, that's what I hear. <laughs> that's what I hear. So we got the ones we wanted to get. Uh, lunch reservations were hard to get. So we still got mm. like, we got to figure that out. I just don't want to have a hot dog in my hand and want to be hunting around like, okay, I'll get in line for the hot dog, honey. You go find a table. And yeah. then you like, you have to like, wait, okay. It looks like that, that pe those people are almost done. You kind of hover mm. and then, oh wait, here's one. But it's like covered in, you know, mustard and napkins and, you know, some sort of liquid that you don't know what Probably it is. Like the counter service type places. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, I don't want to do that. I just want to sit down somewhere. Yeah. Fair. I don't care where. I just don't want to have to deal with that. So hmm. that is now somewhat solidified. So okay. nice. We're just going to make sure we can pay for it now. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Because yeah. it's Disney and yeah. it's not cheap. Yep. That's it for me. What you got going on? <laughs> okay. Um, well, Ellie had her birthday party sleepover event. Happy birthday, Ellie. Thank you on her behalf. Um, <laughs> she's turning 12. And oh my I don't goodness. I know what's happening in the world. Um, she'd never had more than like a friend sleepover before. So was this two, three? Uh, there were six girls that slept over. And there were a couple other friends that came that didn't do the sleepover. So basically like they came over sort of after school. They hung out a bunch. We got dinner and just threw a bunch of chicken nuggets in their face. There we go. And then went to Kids Empire, the place where oh, you yeah. run around and get really sweaty. Was and it less busy than last time? It So Ellie wanted to go a little bit later, so there weren't as many little kids. Though oh. I was still surprised how many like toddlers are running around this place at like 9 o'clock at night. But this is on a Friday night. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, whatever. But they still had a blast. It was yeah. not all that crowded. Okay, good. Um, so they got to have a good time. And they were there for like two, two and a half hours. Nice. Let me say, there was a musk happening oh. a bunch of preteens running around for that long i bet it was it was fine i but bet i bet i bet they had the, a blast i bet the blast. i bet the car was a little it was honestly fine i'm yeah. probably i'm probably overstating it but like i i didn't realize like how much i'd need to be on like water duty like i just had a kind of a thought because they have a water fountain there yeah but i was thinking about like <clears throat> little kids and like okay they may need a drink of water but like they're not all that little anymore like these are all things i have to recalibrate now with my kids they're like they're my kids now are as big as Rachel or bigger. So it's like, oh, if they go somewhere and they're running around, like they're going to need to hydrate be and they're going to consume like multiple bottles of water. So like we brought, I basically like grabbed like, I don't know, I have like a stash of like emergency water. We don't drink bottled water. Like I carry a water bottle all the yeah. time. But I was like, these are all other people's kids and stuff. I don't want to be managing all their water bottles. So I just grabbed like, the in case there's the power's out, whatever, the, <laughs> dug around in my like one of my closets, and like, oh, I have some like bottled water back here. So I like grabbed like basically a whole like almost case of those waters. And they were freaking pounding them down. And I was just like, oh How'd my god. keep gosh. them straight. I we I brought a Sharpie and wrote their names on them and stuff. Wise. Yes. To be fair, the Sharpie was in the car. So it was like, Still. oh, let me grab the car Sharpie. Um, but then I was like, <laughs> They were all running around and they would like do their thing. And they'd come back and they'd like pound down an entire water. And I was like, okay, let me go like refill all these waters over at the water fountain. So I ended up spending like, I mean, I, I sat there a lot, but I was like some high quality water, H2O. like water boy for this whole like group of kids. And then I had her sleepover and it was great. And it was, it was really great. They went to bed at like midnight, which was a pretty reasonable time. Probably because they ran around like crazy and yeah. they were kind of tired. And they slept until like eight. So it was like kind of a normal solid night yeah and it was just great they had a blast and you know they like had sleeping bags and we grabbed like all the blankets and sofa cushions and they were just all over the floor in the room together and they just nice. had a really good time and i think she made a lot of good memories so nice and then rachel and i did like 40 loads of laundry after that oh all the blankets yeah <laughs> bunch of these like Oof. sweaty preteen kids yep. that got like slept on basically every blanket we have in the house so i was like yeah okay we're gonna do a lot of laundry and clean a lot of dishes that's really cool yeah. she's gonna stuff. remember that for the rest of her life yeah that's what i told rachel and Ra to be fair rachel planned most of this but i was definitely like helping with the like 
physical movement of everything and, and all that kind of stuff. But all in all, it went really smoothly. She had a blast, and now Joseph wants to do something similar for his birthday. So there we go. There but we go. It'll be fun. Um, so update on my log grave. Oh, Because yes. I mentioned how I started that. So um, I'll, I'll start at the end. I'll kind of Tarantino it a little bit. Has it been logged? So it's been logged. So all the right. log grave is, is more or less kind of back to normal now. So it wasn't around for all that long. Um, and there's a reason why. What do you mean back to normal? Like, like this, it's ground again. Like you would never know that there's grounds with logs. There's, there's logs underneath, but okay. it's just dirt. You just look at it and you're like, that's a bunch of mud. That's what it looks like. Um, so that's the, that's, so that's the end of the story. Really not really. Cause I have to like, it was really muddy cause we got a lot of rain, which fits into the story. So, um, it's really muddy. It's basically as, as much of normal land as I can get it again until things dry out and I can like put dry dirt and smooth it out because right now I'm just like the weight of the tractor and stuff. I'm just making more ruts and mud and I I can't make it any better than it is. So I've got to just let it be for a while. And plus I just basically dumped a ton of dirt on top of just a pile of logs. So like probably some of the dirt's going to settle down. Yeah. I'm going to have to backfill some more. Um, anyway, so, but it's it's more or less, you look back there and you're like, oh, it just looks like a muddy construction site now, not like gaping holes that you could fall into, like a grave. Um, so uh, it turns out what I had actually dug inadvertently was a pond because what happened, I dug this log grave thing and it was deep into very hard red clay. Yes. Which has zero zero permeability to yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I guess just because of the way that I dug it or the way the land slopes or something, we had one day of some pretty heavy rain after I dug that log grave, it filled with about three feet of water. Like I had a straight up like swimming pool going on. And I was like, oh crap. My initial like harebrained plan was like, oh, just as I cut trees down over the winter, I'll dump the logs in there and then I'll cover it once it gets kind of full. And then I was like, oh, we had one day of rain and it's like three feet of water. So like if it rains again, it's going to be another three feet of water. And then the entire thing is just going to be a pond. But that clay is there no matter what, right? Like, Yeah, but it's normally covered with other soil and grass and stuff that like absorbs the water. Oh, I see. But it became like a collection point for like the entire area. All of the water went into that pit, like red clay. Because you didn't get three feet of rain. No. So that's why I was yeah. that's why I was so baffled. I was that's, like, oh, it's gonna okay. rain. Yeah. I was thinking like a few inches. But I'm not joking. It was feet of rain that were ended up in this thing. And I was oh, like, wow. crap. So were you throwing logs into a pool? So this is where things got interesting <laughs> and kind of fun. <laughs> the adventure continues. <laughs> um I got to to test out Bernoulli's principle with this little pond. Um, so uh, based, it's, I, I won't explain the whole principle, but it's basically like how a siphon Oh, works. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I basically needed to siphon out this pond. Initially, I was thinking like, do I need to like get a sump pump or something like that? Cause to like, you know, pump out all this water, or like a pond pump or something like that. And then I was like, well, wait a minute, let me think about this. It's like when I have like a bucket that I'm needing to siphon or if I need to like siphon like gas out of a gas tank or something like that, you know, as long as it's, as long as there's a height difference there, you know, like the 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 dynamics of siphoning is like gravity sort of works. There's actually kind of two schools of thought as to exactly how siphoning works. It's debatable. But the idea is if you have a body of water and then you have like a hose coming out of it that is filled with that water, and the end point is lower than the where the body of water is, like the gravity or whatever from the hose, as it drops out, it creates like suction and it sucks more water back up into the hose and it basically creates a faucet. But th- it's just through the laws of like fluid, but fluid your, dynamics. But your end point is gonna be higher than your reservoir. Well, so as long as the, the, the true end point is lower. So like you can have the hose go up but then as long as it goes down and down and down and down and the end point is below your body of water, yeah, you can drain it. That's what I'm saying though. How do you get lower than your pit? So I have a hill that was like 50, 70 feet away. Oh. So it's it's kind of fortunate that that's how I ended up doing it. So ah. I was like, if I can make it kind of, if I can connect enough hoses, 
to where I can drop it into that little pond pool thing that I inadvertently created and I can run the hose long enough down the hill, I just might be able to get the siphon going and then the entire thing will just drain itself eventually. And I'm there, I'm not joking. There's probably a thousand gallons of water in this thing. Like it is not a small amount of water. Um, so what I had to do is I had to connect like, I think it ended up being 200 feet of garden hose. How many garden hoses is that? Uh, well, I had one 100 footer and two 50 footers okay. that I eventually ended up connecting, but I had to like start out with one hose and then I realized it wasn't far enough down the hill. So I had to go get another section of hose. Oh. This ended up being like a two hour adventure and it had like already sort of gotten dark and Rachel's like, what's going on? We want to eat dinner. And I'm like, I'm just trying to get this. You're out there sucking a garden hose. Siphoning. So this was like midweek last week. And I was like, I got to siphon the water out of this thing so that I can then fill it with logs and cover it before it rains again. Cause we had torrential rain this weekend too. And I was like, I know more rain is coming. I cannot. There was a lot of rain this weekend. I was like, I cannot spend like hours every week. I siphoning. think it would have filled up. I know. It would have. I think we got even more rain than before. So it I was rained like, all day. So I was like thinking about this all week. I was like, I got to siphon out my freaking log grave oh pond my God. so that I can fit. And I was just like, what am I getting myself into? it shouldn't even exist into? in the first place. It shouldn't. I was like, why did I even do this? <laughs> because this, you wanted to play with your toys. I could just put the logs in the woods. <laughs> I don't need to be buried. Why did I do this? All this is running through my head. But oh, I was like, I'm in man. too deep. Literally. Literally. I have to do this. So uh, eventually it got to the point where, and like, of course, when you're trying to siphon it out, you have to have water in the hose already for the siphon to work. So I'm like 200 feet away from my house and I am like hauling 200 feet of garden hose filled with water, trying to get the siphon to start flowing. And it took me like three or four attempts for it to actually work because I had this little drill pump and that wasn't working. And anyway, eventually I was able to get it to start siphoning. And then as the water was pouring out, it then started like I could see on the garden, the end of the garden hose, like dirty, yeah. like mud water so was coming out. And I was, was like, coming from the... okay, that's coming from the, that's coming from the hole. And this was at like probably six o'clock at night. And I checked on it again the next morning and it was considerably lower. It drained all night. And I think it took about 16 to maybe 18 hours for the entire thing to drain out. Oh my God. But I eventually got it pretty much drained out. And I was like, science. Wow. So that was pretty cool. And then I was like, Okay. And then this weekend I was like, Saturday is going to be beautiful. Sunday is going to be a torrential disaster. So I was like, Saturday is going to be my day to go nuts and fill this thing with logs and cover it with back with dirt. <laughs> so after we had Ellie's birthday party thing, Friday night into Saturday morning, and we're all tired and doing all this stuff from the party and laundry and all that kind of stuff. I was like, Rachel, I'm so sorry, but like, I have to fill this stupid log <laughs> grave today or else I'm going to have to re-siphon everything all over again. And so I was able to get it all done on Saturday and I got it all covered and life is more or less restored in the Goulet's house, household to pre log Wow. Day. But now all the logs that I had sitting around are underground. So that's helpful. Until you make more logs. Until I have more. And now I have a bigger pile of dirt that is just spare red junk clay dirt that I don't know what to do with that Rachel's like, so what are you going to do with all that dirt? And I was you like, bury it, dig a hole and bury it. <laughs> that's the joke I tell Rachel. I was like, I'm gonna dig a hole and bury it. She's like, <laughs> not amused by that joke. Um, oh. Anyway, so log grave adventures continue. So I still need wow. to like finish it. But of course, like it's right next to the old log grave where I just planted grass seed and stuff like that. All that's torn up now because <sighs> I had to drive all over top of it and everything. So I get to redo all of that. But Well, you need to plant some seeds whatever. anyway. Yeah, it's fine. It's like way out in the yard and nobody cares. Um, so that's my crazy adventures. Um, and then I finally finally hooked up my xbox again the 360 After, yep my xbox 360 and played a game what game one did you night. play uh project gotham racing 4 okay i like racing games this yeah is, i'm trying like like zelda fighting games like all the stuff i'm just like nah. yeah yeah it's really like racing games. racing games are relaxing jam yeah 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 so played that for a little bit i'm not that good at it but it's enjoyable i'm not good at any, any games yeah <laughs> fair enough no, no. For as much um, as I play them, I should be way better, but I'm not. There you go. Yeah. So that's it. I have like 10 games that I bought that I still haven't played yet. So at some point I will, but at least it's hooked up now. There you that's go. That's a step. Well, you enjoy that. My, uh, Archer and his friend played the 360 when they came over because yeah. they like to play the the wrestling game WWE All-Stars because it has a very silly creator wrestler feature. Okay. And they just like creating 
insane it's ridiculous things. wrestlers. Yeah, that's fun. That's yeah, fun. they're like, why is that guy called the Rock? Well, let's make something called the Boulder and the Pebble. <laughs> And the boulder can be like a gray man who's really huge, and the pebble can be a little gray man who's really tiny. And they just got a yeah. kick out of that. They're like, "Look, this is like the rock, but everything you could want pebbles like and boulders." A you know? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Um, speaking of Brian and tools, uh, we had a white elephant <laughs> gift exchange here oh, yeah. at work today. We did, and uh, everybody brought in a gift. We did the whole, you know count the numbers you can steal you can't steal sort of thing it's like a 10 to 15 dollar yeah. limit yeah. <clears throat> when it came to be my turn um i uh got something had it stolen and then so once i had it stolen i needed to pick something else i didn't want to steal anything because up uh, i didn't really see anything that i loved and then up at the table where all the unwrapped gifts were there were two bags and a thing that was wrapped in blue wrapping paper that was 100 percent a hammer <laughs> there was it was wrapped as its shape was um so i was like well you know what do i just kind of take a gamble on these two mysteries or do i just choose to have a hammer so not only you chose the hammer did i choose you've chosen well not only did i choose the hammer but uh not surprisingly i found out that the provider of said hammer was one brian Goulet. this guy so uh because you never know what kind of random junk that you're going to get in a white elephant thing. But I was like, nobody's going to be upset in the long term about having a hammer. You, you're going to so, use it. True to form, this man brought in a hammer. I didn't know it was going to end up with Drew, but I'm secretly very glad <laughs> that it did. Because I sort of had him in mind with the conversations we've had on the pencast about you talking about like using your ball peen hammer for various things. And I was just like, no, you need like... Just a regular like claw. I, I have one somewhere. I just don't know where it is. But no. it was it had a blue fiberglass handle. I really liked it. But yeah, it's, now you got it's gone now. This one now you got Stanley here. Nice. Stanley Hudson's gonna it's, it's make good. it happen for you. I almost bought a fiberglass handle one, but I was like, nah, wood is just yeah so much more visceral. Yeah. So anyway, here we go. Spreading. This is one less. I feel like I'm doing a good deed. Spreading the joy of hammers. Yeah, and, and it did not go home with Brian. There was a part of me that's like, he's gonna pick that hammer. I'm not going to lie. I was tempted because <laughs> it was there. <laughs> no, I actually, Rachel participated too. And I almost chose the gift that she brought too. I remember I'm that. Not very observant. Yeah. I didn't even know what she had. She's like, Brian, done. don't pick that. She's like, don't put that, that down. That's what I brought. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I don't want to bring that back home. Um, yeah. And I got a mug and a Christmas beer. Yeah. But enjoy, I don't drink beer. Enjoy that. <laughs> but my in-laws do. So they'll there enjoy you go. that. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what we got going on in our life. We got a couple of company updates and then we'll wrap it up. All right, Drew, we failed on our two hour thing. That's okay. We spilled over, but we're close. Yeah. Um, company updates is a couple. We have a final troubleshooting video of yours about ink flow. Yeah, we're talking about excessive flow and no flow. Those are two extremes. Yes. You don't want either of those. No. Ideally, you want perfect flow. And Drew is going to tell you how to get it. So check that video out. Um, it is holiday season. The holidays are falling weird. Christmas, uh, we're closed Christmas Eve. So that will be We're closed today. Christmas or, Eve, well, Eve, sorry. Eve. Christmas Eve observed. We're observing Christmas Eve on Christmas Eve Eve. Yes. So the Friday before Christmas Eve, we're observing Christmas Eve. Yes. Uh, so we will be closed as a business on Friday, maybe as you're watching this. Uh, Monday, Christmas Day, we'll be closed. So then we have a four-day week, and then we're closed the following Monday, New Year's Day. So it's a little weird with the way the holidays are falling. We're going to end up with like three, four day work weeks in a row. But as it stands, we're not we're planning on skipping any pen casts. Yeah. So the holidays fall kind of weird in terms of like shipping orders and stuff like that. But uh, for a pen cast, it's not going to disrupt too much. So we're going to try to just keep this going straight through. So you'll get us happening. And then we're going to have some, we got like hottest pens, hottest inks of the year. We've already shot those. We're editing them. Those are going to be coming out after Christmas. Uh, and then we got some videos planned for into January. So we're going to keep making videos. So hope you uh, really enjoy that. So, but we'll keep the pencast flowing all through. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us, excuse me, ooh, ask us some questions. Uh, and one we will question them. you could, oh. one question you could oh. ask us. I think that next week we're going to talk, we're going to do like a little bit of a recap of the year as far as it pertains to the pencast. If you have any favorite moments for of the pencast oh. over the past year, 
let me know in the comments yes. and we might talk about them. Yeah, because I think, yeah, we were kind of debating like what should our last Pencast episode of the year be? Because it's yeah. not this one, it's gonna be the next week. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun. So let us Retrospective. Know. Yeah. So um, there you go. Check out Fountain Pens, Ink, Paper, all that stuff on our website, gouletpens.com. And then I have a random fun fact for you. It'll be a short one. Uh, so it's estimated that in the 2023 holiday season, there are 82 million parcels being delivered each day in the U.S. through all the all the shipping services. 82 million parcels per day. Seems like one of those. It seems like that's just a record that's going to be exponentially broken. It's funny you mention that because it's actually a decline from 2022. There what? were 90 million packages a day in 2022, so things have cooled off a little really? bit this year. Yeah. Yeah. So online shopping is down. It is. <gasps> it is. Interesting. As a whole. Well, yeah. hey, based on the mall's popularity, I guess. I don't know if people, it's, that could be. Maybe it's people, uh, might people just are be... going in person more. Yeah. Could be it. Maybe. Could just be, you know, it's been a dramatic year. Interest rates and inflation, stuff like that. Maybe everybody's just chilling out a little bit on the shopping. I don't know. Probably a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Well, that's interesting. That's a fun fact. Yeah. Or they're just consolidating. Maybe they're just buying everything in one place. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But that's still 82 million packages. That's a lot. Every day still is a, lot. a fart ton of packages. Yes. And uh, we are contributing to part of that because we're shipping packages all the time. Um, but our team has been great. They've been on top of things pretty well. So yeah, order away if you're still interested. But it's too late to get it for the holidays. But you know, whatever. Just get it for not holidays. That's all we got for this week. Thank you for watching. And we'll catch you on the next one. Right on. <laughs>